private interests, prejudices, and partial affections, the result of all of our counsels may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the queen, the public weal, peace and tranquility of the island, and the uniting and knitting together of, thy, of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same. In true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Call of the roll. This honorable house now resumes its sitting. Call of the roll. Mrs. Holness. Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Holness. Dr. Clark. Dr. Dr. Chang. Mr. Montague. Mr. Shaw. Mr. Samuda. Ms. Grange, Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Malawu Fort, Dr. Tufton, Mr. McKenzie, Mr. Chuck, Mr. Vaz, Mr. Warmington, Mr. Hutchinson, Mr. Charles, Mr. Green, Mr. Terry Long, Ms. Smith, Mr. Mean, Dr. Dunn, Mrs. Cuthbert Flynn, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis, Mr. Brown, Dr. Brownberg, Dr. Charles, Mr. Chin, Mr. Clark, Mr. Cousins, Ms. Crawford, Ms. Daly, Ms. Davis, Mr. Golden, Mr. Graham, Dr. Guy, Ms. Hamilton, Ms. Hannah, Mr. Henry Keats, Mr. Henry, Mr. Hilton, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Lawrence, Ms. Lee, Here. Mr. Miller, Here. Ms. Morrison, Ms. Nita, Here. Mr. Paulwell, Here. Mr. Phillips, Dr. Phillips, Mr. Robertson, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Sibbles, Mr. Slowly, Mr. Vaz, Mrs. Vaz, Dr. Wheatley, Mr. Williams, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Witter, Mr. Wright, Mr. Holness, yes, Mr. Warmington, and I see PM. Um, members, before we embark on the business of the day, I wish, as a mark of respect, to acknowledge the passing of one of our own, Ambassador Anthony Johnson, OJ, who served in this house and also in the upper house. Members, Ambassador, the Honorable Anthony Johnson, OJ, was a man of many talents. He was a diplomat, an economist, an author, an educator, husband, father, and friend. He was also a six-term parliamentarian committed to improving the lives of Jamaican people. He was an 
extraordinary parliamentarian. He was always prepared. He was passionate and ready to stand up to his beliefs. He shared his knowledge with conviction and humility, and it was a joy to listen to him whenever he spoke. He began his career, history tells us, in 1980 as a senator, and over the next 27 years served the people of Jamaica in both houses of parliament. And he was elected by the people of Northeast St. Catherine in 1983 and served them with distinction as a member of parliament for two terms before returning to his, the Senate where he served for almost a decade and a half. During his political career, he served as Minister of State in the Ministry of Industry and Commerce, Minister of State in the Ministry of Agriculture, and leader of opposition business in the Senate. We shall miss Ambassador Johnson, and we want to extend our most sincere condolences to his family, and in particular, to remember our colleague, Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, his daughter, of whom he was so very proud. Members, May his soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine on him. I am aware, House Leader, that there are other members who would like to. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when I think of our dear friend and former colleague, Ambassador Anthony Johnson, I think of the word decency. Ambassador Johnson was a decent man. He was a genuine soul, a kind friend, an honest and enterprising human being who gave his all to every endeavor. He did not limit himself, Madam Speaker, and he never allowed anyone to place a limit on him. He radiated a gentle, manly deportment, a sense of purpose, and calm, and yet he had a steely resolve. He embraced the most difficult challenges with sincerity, dedication, and determination to achieve results. I was always greeted with outstretched arms, and he had long arms, and a smile, which was reassuring during difficult times. His humility and loyalty were unmatched. During his postings as ambassador to the United States and high commissioner to the United Kingdom, he demonstrated unrivaled passion for our country. And Anthony Johnson was truly a passionate human being. There was no meeting too small for him to attend in person as he championed Jamaica's interest. He had a remarkable way of connecting with people. Just one meeting was all it took for people to find themselves in awe of this outstanding Jamaican who is so admired, was so admired everywhere he went. And by his very height, he stood tall. Ambassador Johnson had a great belief in the capacity of the Jamaican people. He saw it as his duty to empower people around him towards achieving their potential. He took great pride in and paid keen attention to the development of literary works in Jamaica. Himself an author of no fewer than 11 books. When you entered any of his offices, Madam Speaker, there would be a collection of books that told the story of Jamaica. As a diplomat, he took great pride in presenting copies to dignitaries with whom he met in the service of Jamaica. Um, Ambassador Johnson was one of a kind, Madam Speaker. The stories told of his arrival in London at the time of the operation in West Kingston. 
He was invited to be a guest on one of the evening television shows. During that program, he spoke with great Ill elocution about the great attributes of Jamaica and dispel the negative coverage about his country. This led to scores of people turning up arbitrarily at the Jamaican High Commission in London with bags of yellow yam and other produce wanting to meet the new High Commissioner. He left an indelible impression on the people whenever and wherever he went. And so at this time, Madam Speaker, I just want to express that he will be sorely missed. I ask that we keep his widow, Pamela, his daughter, Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, and the other children, relatives and friends, in our thoughts and prayers as Ambassador Anthony Johnson moves on to higher service. May his soul rest in peace and that we will always remember his contribution to nation building. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, I would like to join in this um, period of tribute to the late Ambassador Johnson, who I met for the first time when I started my sojourn in these premises in the upper house. At that time, in 1995, I think he was the leader of opposition business. And both, right, in the Senate, both himself and Mr. Percy Broderick decided, in addition to my people, that they would assist in taking me under their wings. Um, and I, I, I thought both of them were able to give me a good baptism about the conduct and runnings in these premises. In fact, I have found him to be quite remarkable. He was a person who could speak on any subject. In fact, his, his presentations were a precursor to what I experienced from that member from Northeast Manchester in the lower house when I graduated to the lower house because he could take any subject matter and turn it to reflect some of the topical issues of the day. And I just thought that was quite, quite remarkable. He was well spoken and his knowledge was really quite, quite broad on a range of subjects. But even after our debates here, we would oftentimes, before and after, repair to downstairs, and that's when you really get a chance to know the individual. Um, friendly, jovial, and willing to embrace younger people. And uh, we had a very good and successful relationship. And uh, I, too, want to join in remembering him as a great Jamaican who served his country well, who was committed, totally dedicated to his country and loyal to his party. He was a real and true laborite. And I think that is good <laughs> as I am a true and loyal PNP. Uh, I want to also join in expressing our thanks and our condolences to his family because it, is, it was clear that he was a family man and it was clear also that he got tremendous support from his family and especially at this time to single out our colleague, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and indeed all other family members and the Jamaica Labour Party at this time, no doubt, of grief. 
May his soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine on him. Madam Speaker, do I have your permission? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise to pay tribute to an exceptional son of Jamaica who has transitioned. Uh, I'm sure members will agree with me that we are doing this now too often. But Jamaica is itself going through its own transitions of the generations of leaders. Uh, and it is important, Madam Speaker, that this very select body of Jamaicans, the House of Representatives, acknowledge the work and worth of those who have served in these hallowed walls. So it is indeed my privilege and, and indeed uh, duty and honor to offer my own few words of uh, recognition and honor for our former member of parliament for North East St. Catherine former senator, former ambassador, Anthony Johnson O.J. Yes, if you please. I, like other members of this honorable house, uh, was deeply saddened to learn of his passing as he was, Madam Speaker, an outstanding individual. But more than that, I'm sure everyone who knew him, especially members of the House, would agree that he was a gentleman, an incredibly friendly personality. But above all of that, he was a man of great intellect, and great integrity. And he has left a legacy. He has made a significant contribution for which Jamaica is a grateful beneficiary. Uh, Tony, as we call him, was born on the 14th of June, 1938. And from then, I'm certain that his family knew he was destined for greatness. Those who are alumni of the Kingston College would agree with that statement wholeheartedly. He's a, he's a KC man. He attained a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's in international trade and finance from the University of California at Los Angeles. As I said earlier, he served as member of parliament for Northeast St. Catherine. He was a diplomat. Well, before he was a senator, served several terms. He was a diplomat. He served as the high commissioner to the United Kingdom and ambassador to the United States. And of course, he was non-resident ambassador for several countries, including the Republic of Finland, the kingdoms of Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, and the Republic of Ireland, as well as permanent representative to the Organization of American States. Madam Speaker, Ambassador Johnson began his career in the public sector as an economist 
in the Ministry of Finance and as a planner for the Central Planning Unit of Jamaica. I believe that is now um, PIOJ. After, after working in the private sector from 1970 to 1980, running operations of Jamaica Frozen Foods, Jam Grow Limited, and indeed he was the executive director of the private sector organization of Jamaica. I believe he was the first executive director of this body. He then ventured into politics. He made the Jamaica Labour Party the political party of his choice, and he joined in 1980. At this time, our great former leader, Edward Siaga, appointed him to the Senate, after which he took over the role of Member of Parliament for North East St. Catherine in 1983, where he served his constituents with great distinctions, for, with great distinction. Uh, and at different times during his political career, he would speak on several portfolios, technology, education, industry, commerce, agriculture, mining, and energy. And indeed, he could do this because, aside from his sharp intellect, he was well-read and some would say well-written because he was a, an author and I gather he authored maybe about 11 books and articles, major academic articles. Uh, Madam Speaker, he also lectured at the University of the West Indies and uh, many students in the social science uh, faculty uh, would recall him as their lecturer. I believe the course was government and business or government and society, one of, one of those foundation courses. He was awarded the Order of Distinction for service to Jamaica, to the nation, in 2016. OJ, Order of Jamaica, OJ. Madam Speaker, Undoubtedly, he would have inspired, uh, if not influenced, uh, his daughter to follow in his footsteps. And we are very happy and, and very proud of the work that uh, Senator uh, Kabina Johnson, the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, is doing. But, Madam Speaker, we, we would recall somewhere in 1997, uh, I was then uh, entering political representation in the constituency of West Central St. Andrew, um, a seat that was the first to be voided under the new provisions of the Representation of the People's Act. <laughs> and I, I, can, I can see, I can see Ambassador Tony Johnson smiling at that. Uh, obviously, Madam, Madam Speaker, many in Jamaica would not recall that incident. But um, during the rerun of my elections in, in that seat, um, Tony, as we affectionately call him, um, volunteered as a representative of CAFE. I believe that was the name of the, the observer group. And he observed a polling station uh, in a particular division of my Taylor. yes Taylor's basic in, in a particular area of my constituency that rapidly supported the, the no opposition the then government uh, and of course um, you know I thought that he was very brave 
to have done this upon his discovery. Uh, he was almost mobbed, and he had to uh, make a hasty retreat from the area. Very quickly. But he was, Madam Speaker, a strong supporter of the party. Uh, he, he wasn't only... an eloquent speaker, a sharp intellect, but he really believed in the principles, he believed in the philosophy of the party and what the party stood for. And he made his contribution. Even when the party was down, he came out and he made his contribution. And I am grateful for the efforts that he would have made, certainly in ensuring my, my own election. Madam Speaker, in my personal interaction with him, uh, he had a very deep understanding of the history of Jamaica and a political perspective on Jamaica's development. And I believe that his concern, Madam Speaker, was that the political philosophy our core principles as a political organization were not properly documented and properly articulated. And he sought to spend time to do that. And in, in his later years, he would offer his time, volunteer his time uh, as a commentator on public affairs and helping to explain quite a bit in, in the public domain through interviews in, in our various uh, media. Uh, he was ill for some time and withdrew from public life. Uh, and so, Madam Speaker, we were very sad to hear of his passing. I want to express heartfelt condolences to his wife and children, including our own Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Kamina Johnson-Smith, uh, and the rest of his family as, they, are, as they, they mourn his tremendous loss. Jamaica is has indeed lost a servant, a political elder, a patriot, a brilliant mind, a teacher, a hard worker, a great intellect, and a true statesman who has left us with a great legacy and has made an indelible mark on our politics. Uh, may his soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine upon him. The parliament mourns his loss. Madam Speaker, I rise to say a few words in recognition of the late Ambassador, the Honorable Anthony Johnson. His career has been adequately, I think, summarized in the presentations that have gone already, and I won't attempt to repeat them. But it's clear that Tony Johnson was a man of many parts. He had an outstanding career, starting in the public sector, as has been said, then moved to the private sector, where he acquired considerable experience in different companies, and then went into politics in 1980, and he served in this parliament in both houses. And from what I understand, he served with distinction. I knew him more socially than through politics because by the time I entered this parliament, he had already retired from active political life. But he went on, of course, to become both ambassador to Washington for Jamaica and high commissioner to London, two of the prestigious diplomatic posts that exist in this country, rounding off what could only be described as a stellar career in public life. He also, as has been said, was somewhat of a Renaissance man. He was a, a, a keen historian, and he wrote several books, including one, I believe, on the history of Kingston, which was of some um, note and, and quality and added 
to the erudition of that important historical subject. His daughter, Kamina, the current Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, uh, was my colleague in the Senate for several years. And indeed, the last time I think I saw her father was when he attended Parliament to listen to her make a presentation. And I remember observing how the pride in his eyes as he witnessed his daughter acquitting herself well on that occasion. And um, it was a touching scene to see that. So I would just join in the expressions of condolences to his family, his, his widow, his children, and other relatives, friends, and of course to the Jamaica Labour Party, of which he was uh, a distinguished member. And he was a gentleman. He was somebody who brought to the politics or the political life of the country a certain standing, a certain approach that was in the best traditions of our democracy. And we should honor him today. May his soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine upon him. Thank you. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, just one other small point. Not small point, but brief point. I just wanted to mention, it would be remiss of me not to that. I, today I just wanted to acknowledge <coughs> that one of our former colleagues, um, the former member for Eastern Westmoreland, Luther Buchanan, his mother is being buried today. Um, and <coughs> she was a Monteith. Her, I think it was her brother was a senator as well in the parliament, so that is also a political family, and I thought we could just um, note that occasion. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Speaker, my privilege to say a few words in tribute to a friend and colleague, late Ambassador Anthony Johnson. What do you think of Tony Johnson? Is that he was indeed a gentleman politician of his generation. He was deeply coming to the Labour Party, and joined at a time when the ideology was quite contentious and very energetic, you might say. Um, and the divide was very obvious. But throughout all of this, he was always a voice of reason and was never contentious in stating his positions and commitment to the lines of the Jamaican Labour Party. He was, an, he was indeed a, also an avid student of history. So he was always available to give us some less in political history, but critical force in the Jamaica Labour Party, he was always available to speak to younger members about the history of the Jamaican working class labor movement and the contribution of the Jamaica Labour Party and the Boston Industrial Trade Union. Indeed, he became somewhat of a, uh, indeed became an inspiration for those of us who were younger in the party and needed to get an understanding of what transpired during the turbulent years of the development of the political parties, 1930s through the 40s and 50s. It was for him a pleasure, and he, I found it as an active member to invite him anywhere in Jamaica he would go to speak again to the work of the party and his own participation. He served as a member in the Northeast St. Catherine constituency. Um, going on again at a time, you know, Politics is a bit different, let's say, 1983, served for two terms. Although Tony, as a distinguished member of the party, but he was never given great credit for his grasp of political organization, but he did weather the storm of 89, although he left after the second term and served, but served the year with distinction. He served also as deputy leader of the party. Despite being in opposition in the Senate, he stayed the course with the party and went through the difficult times that any Jamaican political party can face in opposition. He took on the responsibility of deputy leader. Um, his commitment helps us to maintain a certain level of organization, but critically he was always a uniting force in the political arena. His style, his personality, um, although an eloquent speaker and a writer, he was a great listener. That's how he became that, you know, person of unity and one who would be always 
able to bring a certain perspective to disputes and contention to be able to calm the waters at any point in time. That was Tony Johnson. He, he stayed the course, as I said, during those difficult days, which stood the challenges of opposition, did his, um, he did writing, taught sometime at university, but I know he was particularly pleased when he was able to be part of a team that restored the Jamaica Labour Party government in 2007 as part of a team with Mr. Golding as leader. And while he did not return to elected politics, he continued to serve in several ways. Most notably, he went off as a diplomat. Indeed, his style fitted in very well, and he served in two of the most challenging posts, but two of the most distinguished diplomatic postings in both North America and London at some point. And certainly in London, his personality really reestablished that strong link with the diaspora. Tony was not only the distinguished high UK High Commissioner, but he really was able to engage the diaspora, the London community, Jamaican community, very meaningfully. He was indeed an outstanding servant of the people. He represented us with enviable distinction. He was a consummate diplomat, a committed politician, Madam Speaker, a statesman, a dedicated public servant. You will miss him. He was a good example for those of us who now um, seek to serve the people. I wish to personally extend the appreciation of my appreciation and the appreciation of the Jamaica Labour Party to his family who allowed us to share his life with us in those difficult times. Particularly his wife, Pamela, his daughter, who is now Senator and Minister of Foreign Affairs, and clearly adopted and built on the foundation of diplomacy her father left her and taught her. She does so with distinction as a credit to her his own, to her father, as his father was as her father was a credit to this country and to the Jamaica Labour Party and to the people of the country. Indeed, Tony represents, as indicated by the Prime Minister in speaking, a generation of leadership that we must always respect and recognize. They took us through the turbulence of independence, took us into literally the turbulence of building a nation, and did so with tact, diplomacy, and distinction, leaving us a country that we must know together unite and build and take him to another level. Wherever he is, I suspect, Madam Speaker, he'll be looking down with a smile and some kindness on the hills of Northeast St. Catherine. We will miss him. And today I say, may light perpetual shine upon him. My friend Tony, walk good. It was a pleasure to have had the privilege of working with you in those years. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I am privileged to say a few words today about Ambassador the Honorable Anthony Johnson, OJ. I first came to know Anthony Johnson as he was then when I entered politics in 1993. And when I met him, the first thing that we shared and had in common, of course, was the fact that um, we both were student, former students at Kingston College, different times, obviously. But when he, when he found out that I was a KC old boy, I think we, we had, it was obvious that there was some, something, a kindred spirit in a number of ways. But Later on, of course, um, we, we came to, in many different ways, overlap each other in a number of different areas. Um, I was to go on to serve in the Senate, as he did. And of course, he traversed many of the ministries that I served in. And so, whenever we'd see each other, we'd have a number of things in common, and we talked about a number of things. And he was, he was a very impressive individual. He was well-read. His sense of history was profound. And Tony could relate almost anything to some historic period in Jamaica and made it very relevant and the conversation, a very relevant conversation. So I always enjoyed 
talking to him. I didn't see him a great deal or very often, but when we did, it was a very meaningful engagement, and I, and I, and I cherish that. But, Madam Speaker, I, today I have to speak on his sojourn at Kingston College and the legacy that he has left at that institution. Anthony Johnson's name is legendary in the annals of Kingston College because he was no ordinary student nor ordinary alumni. Anthony Johnson was a cheerleader for Kingston College, a cheerleader par excellence for Kingston College. Whatever Kingston College was doing, whether it be school challenge quiz or champs or cricket, whatever it was, football, Anthony Johnson was at the forefront cheering and motivating um, the players and lifting up the name of Kingston College. And so, Madam Speaker, it was, it was almost fortuitous that he would have written the definitive book on the history of Kingston College. And he did so, according to him, to leave that as a legacy for the students that were yet to come so that they could appreciate what Kingston College did for him, what Kingston College did for the succeeding generation. Because I think, Madam Speaker, for those of us who are privileged to have gone to the college, it is there that most, if not all of us, would have gotten our grounding into the sociology of the country and, an, and, and being imbued with the sense of service above self. And Anthony Johnson, in his life and in his work, exemplified this true spirit of Kingston College. And I say to you, Madam Speaker, that the, his last real contribution um, to the school was to help to lead the 75th anniversary celebration. That was a, and still remain, a high point in Kingston College's history. And Anthony Johnson provide the leadership, he was part of that leadership for that program, helped to plan and execute the 75th anniversary um, celebration at Kingston College. And the entire Kingston College family would want me to say today that in this, in paying tribute to him today, that his life, his work, and his support for and leadership of Kingston College remains something of honor and something that the Kingston College community applauds. And I want to say to you, Madam Speaker, that all Kingston College students would want, us to, want me to end by saying, in a, apart from recognizing um, and to pay tribute to and condolence to his family, is to thank them for the support and the service that Anthony Johnson gave to Kingston College and that his legacy is one that is imbued with the purple and white and would want it to say Fortis forever and forever Fortis. Madam, Madam Speaker, there's a, there's a saying, Madam Speaker, that in the pursuit of excellence, one person can make a difference. That person was the Honorable Anthony Johnson. He was an outstanding citizen of Jamaica. He was a well-educated all-rounder who served not only in the private sector, but also in the public service. He was appointed to the Senate in 1980, where he served for three years, after which he moved on to serve in the lower house as a member of parliament for Northeast St. Catherine. He was also a minister of government, ambassador to the United States and High Commissioner to Great Britain. 
In all of this, Madam Speaker, I like to say, Ambassador Johnson, he walked with kings and kept the common touch. He had a great sense of humor and was loved by many. He has bequeathed his ex example of excellence to his children, including the Honorable Kamina Johnson Smith, our distinguished Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. May God bless his soul and surround his family with the precious memories of a truly outstanding and inspirational Jamaican. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, I'd like to join with my colleagues on both sides of the honor blouse to pay tribute to an outstanding Jamaican. I do so on two fronts, Madam Speaker. First, as someone who spent a long time in local government, when I became mayor of Kingston in 2003, the late Ambassador Johnson, who penned the first edition of a book on the city of Kingston, approached me and asked me if I was interested in having a review and an update of the book. I gladly consented, Madam Speaker, and I was pleasantly surprised that one of the main feature in the second edition of the book was Desmond McKenzie, who was the youngest mayor in the history of the As a matter of fact, Madam Speaker and colleague, that book took a life of its own. Almost all the countries we visited, and the member from Southwest has been on visits with me overseas, and we always use the opportunity to sell the capital of Jamaica through the eyes of the book written by the late Ambassador Johnson. In 2002, when I was appointed to the Senate, I had the opportunity of serving in the Senate at that time with the late Ambassador as leader of opposition business in the Senate at that time. that I got from him during that period was one that I treasure and treasure sincerely, Madam Speaker. I did some research overnight in order to make this contribution, and I tried hard, and I am hoping that someone will correct me. Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith, who presently serves as leader of government business in the Senate, also serve as leader of opposition business in the Senate. And her father, who we are Um, having the distinction of serving in the Senate, holding that very responsible position of leader of government business. And it is a credit to his upbringing 
of his children that, that his daughter was able to follow in his footsteps in this honorable chamber. And lastly, and quickly as I close, Madam Speaker, in 1975, during the turbulent period of our political life in Jamaica, I was introduced to Anthony Johnson then, when he led the private sector organization of Jamaica in a very responsible position. And I say responsible because during the upheaval in West Kingston and several parts of the corporate area, it was an initiative that he put on the table when we went to discuss the question of peace, where he uses the organization that he was leading in an administrative capacity at the time to bring the business of learn of teaching those who were willing to go into business. And we had a gentleman by the name of Carl Steele who benefited tremendously because of the work of the late Anthony Johnson. The people of West Kingston is immensely grateful and will never forget the efforts that he made to help to uplift the lives of those persons in West Kingston. So on behalf of the local government fraternity, especially those of us here in the corporate area, and I know I express those positions on behalf of the member from Southwest and on behalf of the people of West Kingston, I want to say to Senator Kamina Johnson Smith and the entire family, it says, weeping may endure at night, but joy cometh in the morning. I thank you, Madam Speaker. I met Tony Johnson about 1974. He was the manager of Frozen Foods, as the Prime Minister has indicated. And a more affable person I could never have met. But it didn't take very long talking with him for me to realize that this was a serious politician in the making because we didn't talk for very long before he moved on to the subject of politics. And his politics and his favorite, his favorite subject was the Jamaica Labour Party. And although he never said it, I realized immediately that in the future I would be meeting him in the corridors of the Labour Party office, which I did. He, I think Jamaica, quite frankly, has lost one of its finest sons. It's as simple as that. He was a person that was a very rounded man. And as a member from Northeast Manchester has said, he walked with kings and he did, but never lost the common touch. In the most sophisticated environment that he could be placed in, if you just nudged him on the shoulder and said, listen, after this thing is finished, let's go have a drink around the corner. He just, yes, 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 yes. Somewhat similar to the member from Northeast, St. Andrew. <laughs> but in recalling, you know, there are things that happen in your life, and I am led by the fact that the measure of a person's company is where you can speak alone for hours and never get bored. That was my experience with Tony. He would speak and we will speak on subjects of great interest. But you never felt bored. And I will illustrate his complete, the, the, the manner in which he lived his life. You know, I went to represent the government at the time to United Kingdom. And New York, actually, sorry. And we stayed a little late 
at the function and we couldn't get any meals. They, were, they, they closed and we didn't have anywhere to get a meal. And we had with us Professor E. Nigel Harris, Vice Chancellor of the University. And the three of us took off in a cab in search of somewhere to have something to eat. We were starved. And after driving around, driving around, driving around, Tony said, listen, man. He said to the person driving, he said, listen, man, just find a little corner shop there. A little cold supper shop, anything at all. Let us just park ourselves there and have some meat. And he did that. We went in. It wasn't a restaurant. It was just a place in a, in, a, in a little shop where they had a couple of tables. So we ordered and we got um, chicken sandwiches with gravy. And as we started to eat, he chuckled and he said, now imagine this. I am the ambassador, the high commissioner from Jamaica. Nigel, you are the Vice Chancellor of the University. And Carl, you are the Minister of Industry and Commerce. And we are sitting here having at this little cold supper shop a chicken, a hot chicken sandwich. If anybody were to see that happen, they would be very amused. And it was in fact very amusing. And we had a fantastic night. It couldn't have been, if it was at the world, world of a story, it wouldn't be as pleasant. A lovely, afternoon and that was the nature of Tony he would make you at ease wherever he was Tony was an intellectual who could deny that he was a compulsive writer and the last time I actually saw him he came to visit me and he wanted to sit with me to review some of the things that occurred prior and post 1980 and we had a long discussion, he took notes, I haven't seen if he had written anything about it. But among the things that will probably be overlooked by the very government and members of this party is the fact that leading up to the 2007 election, Tony was the spokesman on agriculture. And it was he who wrote agriculture policy and the manifesto on agriculture leading to the 2007 election. I was general secretary at the time, and you can recount what happened in that election. Thank God, after 18 years. I don't know when another Tony Johnson will pass our way, but certainly his being here has made us all better for it. And uh, I really do have to say to his family, especially his daughter, who we know more than his other. Tony was a great family man, but a private man. Nobody can tell you that they ever remembered being at any place with his family, sitting down, having drinks and all this kind of thing. He was a private person that dealt with the things that he thought were important for the development of Jamaica. God bless you and rest well, my friend. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Speaker, colleagues, I rise like those before me to pay tribute to an individual who I agree, I think we all agree, has made a sterling contribution to public life. In my experience with Tony Johnson uh, straddles both the public policy component and includes also the academic, as my colleague said before me, he's a, he was an intellectual. He taught at the University of the West Indies for a number of years, and the subject that he was most famous for was the business, government, and society. Just to correct the people, <laughs> and the society. And uh, Tony literally wrote the book on that particular topic, and if you just look at the topic, uh, you one can imagine how wide uh, the scope, the areas that he had to touch on, and to make it understandable and interesting, and essentially to position business, government, and society as the parts that make up 
the normal functioning of our community and our country. And he literally wrote the book on that. And while he was doing that, I was a slightly younger lecturer in the same department teaching uh, a few other different topics. But I enjoyed the engagement with Tony and actually went out of my way a number of times to just sit with him and to listen to his experiences, his research, his scholarly exploits, and the lessons that he would have discerned from both his practical experience as well as his study. And I learned a lot from him, and I want to place on record here my appreciation for that as a young lecturer at the university while he was there. Beyond that, I want to recognize and celebrate his contribution because, to be totally frank, Tony actually gave me the first lessons in parliamentary procedure when I was appointed senator back in, I think it may have been June 2005, no, 2005, yes, 2005. June 24th, actually, 2005, and I was appointed a senator, and he was leader of opposition business at the time. And clearly, I had a lot to learn, and I've learned a lot since then. <laughs> but in that period with Tony as, quote unquote, the leader of that group, uh, you know, I could depend on him for wise counsel. I could depend on him as he maneuvered the, the course in that setting and could depend on him for just the little tidbits that boosted your confidence and provided you with the energy and the focus to make your contribution. He did well uh, in that role as he did in so many other roles that he played. But my experience with him also as a diplomat should be mentioned because Tony Johnson, while ambassador to Washington, D.C., served um, with my sister, who was actually the number two at the time. Uh, and I, I want to just say on her behalf, uh, she has sent me a note to express condolences to uh, Tony and his family. She now serves under the ministerial guidance of Tony's daughter, of course, uh, our colleague, um, Senator Kalina Johnson-Smith. And in visiting Washington and having conversations with him again, I would learn the art of diplomacy and the discussions there were rich, rewarding, and, 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 and fulfilling, certainly from a personal perspective. So, Madam Speaker and colleagues, I say all of this to say that for my own development, in my own development, Tony Johnson played a role. I mean, I served with his uh, daughter in uh, earlier years in G2K, not just now in the cabinet, and uh, clearly she represented him well in all aspects of her own life. And I want to thank him for that contribution, and like the rest of us, uh, uh, wish for his family uh, Godspeed as they celebrate a life that has been well lived. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I am now going to ask that we stand and observe a minute's silence in respect.
May his soul rest in peace, and may light perpetual ever shine upon him. Um, members, I am going to ask the clerk to send condolences along with the Hansard containing the tributes paid to his widow and his family. I also want to, I would also like to express the condolences of members of this honorable house on the passing of Mr. Buchanan, who was the member from Westmoreland East, the mother, the mother of the, the mother of the member, um, for that the former member of Westmoreland Eastern. And I will ask also that the clerk write and send and express our condolences on our behalf to him. Statements. Madam Speaker, at a later stage today, I will ask for the recommittal of statements by ministers to allow the Most Honorable Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance and the Public Service to make their statements. Thank you. Announcements. Laid on the table of the House today is a copy of the Independent Commission of Investigations first quarterly report 2021 entitled Special Investigation Incidents of Searches by Law Enforcement January to March 2021. Bills brought from the Senate. The following is a message from the President of the Senate. To the Honorable House of Representatives, I have the honor to advise the Honorable House of Representatives that on the 30th day of April, 2021, a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Justices of the Peace Act and for Connected Matters was passed in the Senate without amendment. Signed, Thomas Tavares Finson, OJCD QCJP, President of the Senate. Petitions. Papers, reports from committees, notices of motions given orally, questions and answers to questions, motions that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice, motions relating to the sittings of the House, motions for leave to introduce bills, Presentation of bills without leave of the House first obtained public business. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now move to introduce and have read a first time a bill shortly entitled the Constitution Amendment Impeachment Act 2021. A bill shortly entitled the Constitution Amendment Impeachment Act 2021, read a first time. Madam Speaker, I beg to give notice of second reading of the bill. Um, I'm now going to call upon the Honorable Delroy Chuck, QC, MP, Mem uh, Minister of Justice, for his presentation this evening. Minister Chuck. Permission granted, Minister Chuck. Um, Madam Speaker, I am grateful for the opportunity 
to report on the achievements of the Minister of Justice in this my sixth consecutive year as Minister of Justice. I'm equally proud to appear in this honourable house on behalf of the constituents of Northeast St. Andrew, serving as their Member of Parliament for 23 plus years. Mr. Prime Minister, I extend heartfelt gratitude to you for your continued confidence in my ability to captain the reform efforts within the justice sector. To my hardworking team at the Justice Ministry, I extend wholehearted appreciation. I would like to especially thank Mrs. Sancia Bennett Templer, who served as Permanent Secretary for two productive years. I also take this opportunity to officially welcome Mrs. Grace Ann Stuart McFarlane into her new post as Acting Permanent Secretary. After serving as a bastion of expertise in the ministry for over four years, I am grateful, Madam Speaker, for a team that has displayed composure and innovation in a very difficult period for our nation. As a result of their work, Madam Speaker, Jamaicans continued to receive sterling justice services, even in one of the most difficult periods experienced by modern society. I can only add, Madam Speaker, that the best is yet to come. I also thank, Madam Speaker, the Chief Justice, Honorable Mr. Justice Brian Sykes, other members of the judiciary, and the staff of the Court Administration Division for their commitment to the improvement of the justice sector. I'm co confident, Madam Speaker, that with our continued partnership, it will take us gradually and closer to realizing our shared goal of elevating our justice system to the best in the Caribbean and one of the best in the world. The judiciary and the court system Madam Speaker, have my full support as we work together to create a first-class justice system. Madam Speaker, may I make, give special thanks to the President of the Court of Appeal, the Honorable Mr. Justice Patrick Brooks, and also to the Honorable Dennis Morrison, who retired as President in December 2020. To the Appeal judges and the Court of Appeal staff, to the Attorney General, Mrs. Marlene Malalou Fort, Solicitor General, Mrs. Marlene Aldred, and the staff of the Attorney General's Chambers, Director of Public Prosecutions, Ms. Paul, Paula Loylin, and her staff, the Director of Court Administration Division, Mrs. Tricia Cameron Anglin, and her staff, for their sterling contribution to the advancement of the work of the courts and the justice system. Special thanks also to the various affiliated agencies and departments of the Justice Ministry, including the Administrator General, Mrs. Lorna Brown, and her staff for protecting the interests of minors, creditors, and beneficiaries of estates, to the Chief Parliamentary Counsel, Ms. Judith Grant, and her staff, the Acting Director of Legal Reform, Ms. Nadine Wilkins, and her staff, for contributing to the development of a robust legislative framework. In the same vein, Madam Speaker, I express thanks to Mr. Maurice Bailey, former director of that unit, who, after tenure marked by professional acuity and commitment, proceeded on retirement leave. I must extend gratitude also, Madam Speaker, to one particular group of stakeholders whose impact on the justice sector cannot be measured our donor partners. With their support, we have been able to execute plans and strategies in support of the justice reform program, including the improvement of the built environment of the justice sector. Special thanks to the delegation of the European Union to Jamaica, Global Affairs Canada, the United States Agency for International Development, the Inter-American Development Bank, the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Section in the United States, Embassy, the Department of International Development, DFID, the United Nations Development Program, National Integrity Action, the Citizens Security and Justice Program, and the United Nations Children's Fund 
for their continued support of justice sector strategic objectives. To my CPO, Close Protection Officer Sergeant Howard Hamilton, and my driver, O'Neill Ennis, I send heartfelt thanks. I also express my gratitude, Madam Speaker, to my two councillors, Deputy Mayor Winston Ennis and Councillor Joy Cottrell, and constituency support staff who assisted in ensuring a sixth consecutive term as Member of Parliament. And finally, Madam Speaker, I owe a debt of gratitude to my wife, Patricia, and all our family members for being constantly at my side as I execute my duties as Minister of Justice and Member of Parliament. My heartfelt thanks to you all. Madam Speaker, I begin my presentation, as usual, with a report on our courts. Firstly, I underscore that I cannot and do not interfere with the judiciary in its management, decision-making, and operations. So my presentation will focus on what is expected from the judiciary and how the Ministry of Justice provides support and resources to achieve agreed objectives. I start by extending heartfelt commendation to the Chief Justice and his team for their achievements over this past year. Of note, Madam Speaker, is how the judiciary quickly adjusted to the exigencies arising from the pandemic. And in this regard, I am pleased to highlight that during the last fiscal year, the High Courts began hearing matters electronically. All hearings from the Court of Appeal are now conducted electronically using video and teleconferences. And at the Supreme Court, bail hearings and mentioned matters were moved into the virtual space. This allowed for adherence to the necessary distancing protocols and resulted in greater convenience for court users and more efficient use of court resources. Actual performance statistics, Madam Speaker, for the year indicate as follows. In the Court of Appeal, approximately 68% of judgments were delivered within six months of being reserved. The clearance rate in that court is 8 to 1%, an increase of 11% over 2019. That is 8 to 1 cases from every 100 reserved. In 2020, the Supreme Court delivered 234 judgments for every 100 reserved. If the trajectory holds, Madam Speaker, with current trends, during this fiscal year, the Supreme Court is expected to deliver one and a half times the number of judgments being reserved. And by the end of this fiscal year, it is expected that over 90% of judgments outstanding will be current. We project, Madam Speaker, that no more than 10% of judgments will be outstanding for more than six months. Based on current trends, Madam Speaker, by the end of 2021-22 fiscal year, upwards of 75% of judgments be, will be delivered within six months. Sure, Madam Speaker, there is progress, but the norm, and that is the Chief Justice's, my indication to the judges, should be for judgments to be delivered within six months. It should only be in exceptional cases that judgments should be delayed beyond six months. In truth, Madam Speaker, we are getting there. We have not reached there, but we expect by the end of this fiscal year that will be the occasion and the performance of the courts. Madam Speaker, I would also like to address the matter of net case backlog. That is the proportion of active cases that are over two years old. This has been a continuous source of discontent, and its reduction is one of the strategic objectives for the Justice Ministry. I know the Chief Justice and the Judiciary have paid particular attention to this matter, and they have been making impressive strides in this regard. The Grand Court is expected to be current with its active cases by December 2021. That's this year, Madam Speaker. By the end of the current fiscal year, Less than 10% of the active cases in the civil division 
of the parish courts will be in backlog. Since 2016, Madam Speaker, when we began collecting data, 83.77% of criminal cases were disposed of under 12 months. Approximately 88% of cases were disposed of under 24 months and only 12% in more than 24 months. In 2020, the overall clearance rate for criminal cases in the parish courts was 96.47%. Seven of 13 parish courts had a clearance rate of more than 90%, and the hearing date certainty was 84%. This means that over 95% of cases, Madam Speaker, will be resolved in a timely manner. Madam Speaker, the overall net case backlog for the parish courts is now under 2.64% placing us well within the international best practice guideline of under 5%. Madam Speaker, this is the best position the parish courts have been in in recorded history. The Home Circuit Court has seen a clearance rate of over 70% during the last two years. This means that matters are moving faster in the Home Circuit Court than in previous years. Once again, Madam Speaker, this is the best position that this court has been in recorded history. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we are making commendable strides on our way to meet the Chief Justice's goal to have a justice system that is among the best in the Caribbean and the world. However, Madam Speaker, we need to even do better with the few remaining cases of backlog. The Ministry would like to see definitive timelines for various processes in the courts. I believe that no matter, no matter in the parish courts should extend from filing to completion beyond 24 months. And I expect that 90% of these cases should be completed within 12 months. We're getting there, Madam Speaker, and I hope it is achieved in this fiscal year. In the Supreme Court, Madam Speaker, no trial matter should remain there longer than three years, and certainly 75% of the matters should be completed within two years. Uncontested divorce, Madam Speaker, that used to take years, should be completed within six months, and probate and administration of estates, which used to take years, Madam Speaker, should also be completed within four months. Madam Speaker, three years ago, I indicated in one of my presentations that there was a probate that was just finalized after 36 years. <laughs> I think members will recall that. Well, I'm saying, Madam Speaker, that most matters are now being completed on time, and we expect that in this fiscal year, divorces, probate, and administration of estates will be completed within months. As we, you would realize, Madam Speaker, from the actual performance data, shared targets are now being achieved in some cases. But it is, Madam Speaker, the isolated circumstances that receive attention from the public and the media to which we must pay attention. Whilst we see the enormous improvements in the courts and see even greater improvements forthcoming, we cannot ignore the frustration of litigants and the members of the public when a few cases are highlighted that seem to undermine how well the court is actually functioning. When bail, Madam Speaker, is granted to individuals charged with murder and other serious offences, some members of the public question how bail could be granted to those individuals. In fact, Madam Speaker, many of these accused individuals actually continue to commit bail, sorry, crimes while on bail. The judiciary, Madam Speaker, should be aware that the police are very critical of the decision to grant bail. And perhaps an explanation should be given when bail is actually granted. So the prosecution can appeal if necessary. By the same token, Madam Speaker, when a decision is refused, an explanation can be given so the defense can appeal. 
So, Madam Speaker, what one is saying is that when bail is granted, a simple explanation from the judge is usually useful because, Madam Speaker, it could well be that the file has been sitting, cannot be completed for years, a year, 18 months, and what is on file does not show a very strong case against the accused. It may well be an issue of illegal possession of firearm, and there is no certificate from the forensic lab, and therefore without the certificate, there can't, the case can't go forward, and it is just unfair to keep the accused there months after months, mention day after mention day. And in those circumstances, the judge really has very little choice but to grant bail. And in those circumstances, Madam Speaker, it is necessary for the various agencies of government, be it the forensic lab, be it the medical doctor, be it the police, that all of these work in partnership so that case files can be completed and presented so that cases can be dealt with in a timely manner. Again, Madam Speaker, when sentences are lenient, are out of the established sentencing range, the public is also alarmed at the inadequacy of the sentence. It was with this in mind that I recently tabled two bills aimed at giving the prosecution right of appeal against certain judgments of the courts, including appeals against a lenient sentence. This is a timely and game-changing development, Madam Speaker, as these amendments will bring us in line with members of the Commonwealth, like Barbados, Bermuda, and the United Kingdom in balancing the interests of justice. Additionally, Madam Speaker, the Legal Reform Department and the Ministry have started working with the Ministries of Government to update relevant penalties to allow for more realistic sentences in line with the rule of law and international best practices. These will then be brought to Parliament for consideration and time allowed for the public to weigh in on the proposals. Madam Speaker, at the end of the day, the executive and the country are looking to the judiciary to play a significant role in sending the clearest signals to criminals that crime has severe detrimental consequences. This can be accomplished, Madam Speaker, by timely trials, strong pronouncements from the bench, and in appropriate cases, harsh sentences that send a powerful message and an emphatic denunciation of criminal activities. Madam Speaker, for murder and all serious crimes, life imprisonment is the penalty. And there is no doubt, Madam Speaker, no case is the same as another. And in some cases, Madam Speaker, when the person pleads guilty, there can be concession in terms of some years taken off, and the reduction of sentences is quite appropriate in many of these cases. But Madam Speaker, where the crime, be it murder or other serious offenses, is so gross, so gruesome, whether or not the offender pleads guilty, the court should send a salutary message, the strongest message possible, that that individual, when he is sent to jail, won't see outside again. And what this means, Madam Speaker, and I urge the court to bear it in mind, not in all cases, please, but in those cases where you have grievous, egregious wrongs, that the signal should be sent of not only life imprisonment, but sentence without parole, or sentences after 60 years of imprisonment, so that if they come out at all, Madam Speaker, it is to spend the last few years before they leave the part the cert. Because, Madam Speaker, it is very important, and this Parliament is saying it to the judges, for gruesome crimes, for murders that are so gross, the proper signal must be sent 
to would-be and potential criminals. And so, Madam Speaker, while in the vast majority of cases, there will be grounds for reduction of sentence when the person pleads guilty, and there will be cases for negotiation of sentence. We are talking about those cases, Madam Speaker, small minority admittedly in many cases. They must be used as example to send a message to the public and to those who don't want to be friends of this society. Madam Speaker, as you have already heard, the Government of Jamaica is now working assiduously towards completing the framework to connect all parish capitals with broadband connectivity within the next six months or so. Hopefully within the next few years, Madam Speaker, improved and efficient broadband capacity should be available across most of Jamaica. As we move closer to our vision of a justice system that offers first-class services, the Ministry of Justice has been giving ongoing support to the courts, equipping them with the modern infrastructure and the technology necessary to conduct business efficiently. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we decided to accelerate the pace at which we rolled out our programs in this respect. We have installed state-of-the-art technology in at least one court in each parish to enable virtual hearings. Through improved technology, we continued court hearings throughout the pandemic here, and matters are being disposed of at an impressive pace. Through improved technology, Madam Speaker, vulnerable witnesses can now testify in complete anonymity from two mobile units, which have been retrofitted with audiovisual equipment and a wheelchair lift, as well as space to facilitate a stretcher. Through improved technology, Madam Speaker, jury selection, case flow and docketing management, case scheduling and digital recording will be enhanced through judicial case management system, the JCMS, which was installed in the last financial year and has now been customized for pilot in this month, 2021. Madam Speaker, when the Minister of Justice says it is facilitating access to justice for all, this is what it looks like. Madam Speaker, we want to work with the Chief Justice, the Court Administration Division, the Commission of Police and the Ministry of National Security, so that in each police station or prison, there can be a witness room where accused persons who are not on trial can attend for their bail hearing or mention date. Additionally, witnesses and accused individuals who have difficulty attending court due to their physical location can connect by Zoom or a similar platform, along with an independent person to ensure that they are not being coached or influenced to give evidence. My vision, Madam Speaker, is to have all court matters dealt with virtually, and only those who want to be in court need to be present. Cases can be tried with only the presiding judge and registrar present. Attorneys can decide whether they prefer to operate from their chambers or, in the case of the Director of Public Prosecutions, from the comfort of her office or even from her home. Going forward, Madam Speaker, we expect that more courts will use technology to deal with mentioned matters, bail applications, and ultimately trial matters. Madam Speaker, what this will translate to is an enormous saving for the public purse, less wear and tear on government vehicles and other resources, less engagement by per police personnel to transport accused and witnesses to courts, and cost, sharings, cost savings to all who participate in court hearings. So, Madam Speaker, what one is saying is that, hopefully within months, not years, that cases can be dealt with where a witness in the hills close to the police station can actually go to the police station and give evidence at the police station without having to travel tens or 20 miles to the parish court in order to give evidence. Moreover, Madam Speaker, witnesses could also, from remote locations, be it the mobile units that we are providing at the Ministry of Justice, or even at the police station, or even abroad, Madam Speaker, can give evidence and the cases can be tried virtually. This will be an enormous amount of savings, Madam Speaker, if you hear 
the police vans taking prisoners from 100 man station, GP, district prison, every morning. There should be no need for this, Madam Speaker. The accused can actually sit in a witness box in the police station or the prison and participate in the trial in the vast majority of cases. There will be cases, Madam Speaker, that it will be necessary to, for the accused to be in court, especially for jury trials. But in general, Madam Speaker, I look forward to the day when these trials are virtual, and I hope it will be soon, Madam Speaker. Another vision, Madam Speaker, that I have for the courts is that they will soon become paperless. I previously made the pledge, and the Minister of Justice remains committed to this objective, where all documents will eventually be filed online and stored digitally. This, Madam Speaker, will free up hundreds of thousands of square footages in, across the court complexes. Any one of us who have had the opportunity to visit a court complex will see one, two, three big rooms, some of them as big as this parliament, Madam Speaker, <laughs> storing documents. I dare say, Madam Speaker, if we could clear all of the space and put them digitally, the amount of space that be opened up in the court complexes would be enormous and that includes the Supreme Court, Madam Speaker, where huge numbers of files are stored in documents, and all of these need to be digitized. So, Madam Speaker, with a paperless court and virtual court hearings and actual reality, we may need to look how we use court space and, in fact, Madam Speaker, how we build new courts, because less space will be required. Madam Speaker, court efficiency easy access to justice services, and the timely delivery of justice are the hallmarks of a first-class justice system. We have taken the first steps towards these objectives, but much more needs to be done. In the Court of Appeal, Madam Speaker, we have now provided first-class facilities and a full complement of 12 Court of Appeal judges plus the President. It means, Madam Speaker, that on a regu regular basis, at least three panels can sit. Madam Speaker, we have a major problem with transcript and with appeal cases. The truth of the matter, Madam Speaker, is that more cases are actually going to the appeal court than are actually being disposed of. And this is a great cause, Madam Speaker, for concern. Because in 2019, Madam Speaker, we had, in 2019, Madam Speaker, we had 221 cases filed, 179 disposed of. In 20, sorry, in 2019, 276, and 2020, 221 new cases filed. And in 2019, appeals disposed of 193, while 276 new cases filed. In 2020, 221 filed, 179 disposed of. It means, Madam Speaker, that more appeals are piling up in the appeal courts. But now, Madam Speaker, with 12 appealed court judges plus the President, an increase from six appeal court judges plus the President, I hope that we will now start, Madam Speaker, to see a greater disposal of cases in at that level. One of the major, major problems, Madam Speaker, is the transcript, which takes forever to actually reach the appeal courts. We have no cases, Madam Speaker, which is in the press and which will come out again and again where persons have appealed. And having appealed, especially in um, criminal cases, they have been waiting in custody for six, eight, as long as 10 years and your transcript is not ready. So you can't blame the appeal courts, Madam Speaker. You have to blame what has happened to those transcripts. And Madam Speaker, the Chief Justice is aware of the problem. We have brought it to his attention, and I know that he's doing something about it, but much more needs to be done for these transcripts to be brought up to date so that these cases can be disposed of in a timely manner. In truth, Madam Speaker, 
the Court of Appeal in 2019 had 18, 1,817 pending cases, and in 2020, 1,859. But half of these cases are actually awaiting transcript. But still, Madam Speaker, half of them, eight, 900 of them, still need to be disposed of in a timely manner. And Madam Speaker, my great hope as a timeline is that no appeal from the appeal is lodge should last more than 18 months. This is not now possible with the backlog of cases, Madam Speaker. But the truth is that better matters will have to be dealt with by the President of the Court of Appeal. And I would like to urge the President of the Court of Appeal is to start looking at how, instead of disposing of hundreds of 200 cases, how can we dispose of four or 600 cases over the next few years? And I have a formula to give him, Madam Speaker. The truth of the matter, Madam Speaker, is that when cases go on appeal, there's no reason why they should take days and weeks for trial. I would urge the President to send out a practice direction to all the attorneys in appeal cases to have a summary of the facts, support of the grounds of appeal, a comprehensive argument in support, and Madam Speaker, that each side should be able to present his or her case within an hour. Madam Speaker, I practice in the Court of Appeal, and if you don't have a good case within an hour, you can forget it. The likelihood is that you won't be successful. And I can say, Madam Speaker, as one who has been successful in the Court of Appeal, the average time I spend on any case is less than half an hour. Yes. Because I get straight to the point. And when you get straight to the point, you get the judges right away, and the judges just ask the other side, what are your arguments against? And so, Madam Speaker, I would urge the Court of Appeal to streamline the present practice because we need to get these appeals out quicker. And while more transcripts will be coming, Madam Speaker, and more appeals will be coming, at this, the Court of Appeal level, we expect that the backlog will be significantly reduced. Madam Speaker, the main area of efficiency that we must look at is how can we get the cases dealt with quickly and the way, Madam Speaker, is if you have a trial in the civil court now, Madam Speaker, it is now being set not for 2021, nor 22, nor 24, nor 26. Cases are now being set for 2027. Yeah. Now, Madam Speaker, any case that is now being set for 2027, by the time it is tried, the witness is not, can't tell the, the true facts. I think there will be fantasizing. And I say, Madam Speaker, the only alternative is that we have to look at ways and means. Lawyers in this country will have to persuade litigants that they have to use alternative dispute resolutions. In other words, Madam Speaker, mediate rather than litigate. And those cases that are present in the courts and are now being referred to mediation Make your best effort to settle these cases because mediation is a win-win situation. When you wait to 2025, 2026, or 2027, it's not a win-lose. It is a lose-lose situation by the time you get there. So I would urge, Madam Speaker, litigants and attorneys to really look at how they can take most of these cases from the litigation in the courts and try to mediate. And Madam Speaker, the government will be doing its very best to ramp up mediation, not only in the Supreme Court, but also in the parish courts. Because it is urgent that in the parish courts, we get all the civil cases to be referred for mediation. And in the criminal cases, in the Supreme and uh, parish courts for criminal cases, we need to use more restorative justice, justice that heals 
rather than if trying to get these persons as best as possible, trying to ramp up and go through a long trial. If they can be encouraged to plead guilty and also to make up with their victims in appropriate cases, Madam Speaker, a lot of these cases can be dealt with. So, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Justice will be going to Cabinet shortly to put a paper and a strategy for alternative dispute resolution across not only the courts, but across Jamaica. In truth, our people need to resolve disputes, disagreements, difficulties in a more appropriate, reconciliatory manner, rather than feel that if they don't get the last lick, they can't succeed. They have to find ways and means, Madam Speaker, to see how they can really pull things together and reconcile as best as possible. So, Madam Speaker, restorative justice has been a major success across the parishes. We have a restorative justice centre in every parish. We know of 18 restorative justice centres, Madam Speaker, and there's the success of restorative justice practice is really overwhelming. In 2020, 2021 fiscal year, Madam Speaker, 18,000 Jamaicans participated in restorative justice conferences. And 1960 cases which came into our centers, 18, 1,804 of them were successfully resolved. Colleague, members of parliament, this represents a 92% success rate. Madam Speaker, we are now taking it into the correctional services and we see great success to heal the offenders, the accused who are now in custody in prison, to, con to make up with many of the victims and families that have abandoned them. And this is a success story, Madam Speaker. Another year of su great success, Madam Speaker, is child diversion. Child diversion, Madam Speaker, is the process of implementing measures for dealing with children who are alleged, accused of, or recognized of having infringed a penal law without resorting to, resorting to formal judicial proceedings. The Justice Ministry, Madam Speaker, established this method of intervention to rehabilitate children who have committed a diversion offense, reduce the number of children exposed to the criminal justice system, and empower communities to re-socialize child offenders. Madam Speaker, the program officially commenced operation in April 2020, approximately one year ago. I am pleased to announce, Madam Speaker, that since its implementation, 305 Jamaican children between the ages of 12 to 17 years have been referred to the program. This means, Madam Speaker, that 305 at-risk children have been given a second chance. 305 children who might have otherwise ended up in the penal system are being rehabilitated into their families and communities. 305 children, Madam Speaker, who might otherwise have become more deeply immersed into a life of delinquency and violence are being nurtured towards becoming productive, well-adjusted citizens. Madam Speaker, I appreci express appreciation to members of the community who have partnered with us to deliver this program. We are engaging, Madam Speaker, police officers, guidance counselors, probation aftercare officers, child protection and family services staff, and other stakeholders. In the current fiscal year, Madam Speaker, we will continue our training and sensitization sessions as our, our objective is to increase our capacity to reach even more Jamaican youth before this transition into a life of crime. Madam Speaker, one of, if I may say, a secret, because it is not well known, that is provided by the Ministry of Justice, is the victim services or assistance and support that we give to victims of crime. And Madam Speaker, so many counselling, over 200,000 victims since 1998 have been counselled by the Victim Services Division. And last year, Madam Speaker, we assisted over 5,590 new clients. 
and assisted 7,867 follow-up clients and gave support to 2,407 child victims with trauma and grief therapy support. Madam Speaker, the truth is that we are now moving even further by using e-counseling, e where we do video conferences and do virtual meeting, meetings and real-time therapy and consultations. And we hope, Madam Speaker, to improve and expand on that service because there are so many victims, Madam Speaker, of crimes who have been traumatized and need further assistance. So, Madam Speaker, when the Ministry of Justice says that it is facilitating access to justice for all, this is what it looks like. <laughs> Madam Speaker, there's an area that we, I have given a lot of attention to, and that is the training and empowerment of justices of the peace, and also to increase the number of notary public. In truth, Madam Speaker, we have trained many more justices of the peace. We have urged outstanding Jamaicans of unquestionable integrity to become a justice of the peace. And through the Justice Training Institute, we have been able to assist and train new persons to become JPs, but also, Madam Speaker, to assist the outstanding justices of the peace to improve their knowledge, information, and for them to be better able to assist their communities. Madam Speaker, the JPs are playing an outstanding role, not only as lay magistrates, but they are doing, many of them are restorative justice facilitators, child diversion officers, but they are also, Madam Speaker, playing their part as a justice of the peace. And all justices of the peace now, Madam Speaker, are no longer a justice of the peace for the parish. Once they are commissioned, they are a justice of the peace for the island. So you are a justice of the peace for Jamaica. And so the seals, Madam Speaker, some may still have the parish, but all new seals will say justice of the peace for the Jamaica. And this will, over time, Madam Speaker, be changed out. Madam Speaker, as I speak to justice of the peace virtually every week, the emphasis I say to them, as a justice of the peace, not only are you a volunteer, you must not act in any way inappropriately, but you must remember your name, justice of the peace. So you must provide justice in your community, and you must secure and keep the peace in your communities. And that, Madam Speaker, is what we hope to really empower them to do, to provide justice services and to secure and maintain the peace. Madam Speaker, another area of great concern, critical justice service, is in delivering to Jamaicans expungement of certain criminal convictions for those who meet the qualifying requirements. Madam Speaker, I hope to take to Cabinet and to Parliament shortly an expansion of expungement cases. Madam Speaker, there are so many cases which cry out for expungement, but because they're in the third schedule of the Act, cannot be expunged. I can give you hundreds of cases, Madam Speaker, that are turned down because, yes, they're serious at the time they were committed. And they got, these persons have got long sentences, 10 years sometimes and more. But, Madam Speaker, they have returned to their community. They have lived fairly upright life for 15, 20 and more years and now they would like their sentence to be expunged. And I say, Madam Speaker, if they have served their time, paid their due, and after 10 years or 15 or 20 years, Madam Speaker, I think the opportunity should be given to them for their sentence to be expunged. And Madam Speaker, I will be taking this matter to, to Cabinet shortly, and thereafter I will bring it to Parliament for us to examine it, because yes, we must be careful. Yes, we must make sure that when we expunge a record, that that individual has demonstrated that they have given up on crime and that they will continue to lead a decent life. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Justice also provided marriage licenses. Even during the pandemic last year, Madam Speaker, we had 1,195 marriage licenses. 
and there were over 3,000 walk-in applications. And they were provided and approved in 24 hours, Madam Speaker. The Ministry of Justice, through that avenue, provided $16.8 million to government income from this service. Madams, Madam Speaker, I ask that the member be allowed an additional 15 minutes to complete his presentation. The question before the House is that the member be allowed an additional 15 minutes to complete his presentation. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Member? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and also to the members of the House for the additional time. I will not breach that trust. I will try and finish up within this 15 minutes. Madam Speaker, we are now improving the justice environment. And one of the areas, Madam Speaker, we intend is to put in place proper justice facilities. Madam Speaker, all the courts, most justice facilities got some attention over the past few years. But Madam Speaker, my great regret is that we have not yet started to build the parish court complexes that we had hoped would have started. But we hope, Madam Speaker, that the Manchester court can be started, if not within the next 12 to 18 months. And we are also trying to get St. Anne Trelawney, St. Catherine, St. James it to, to be shovel ready so that when the funds are ready, we can immediately implement them. And I know, Madam Speaker, that the member from in front of me, Maypen, up to today, I spoke to the Minister of Finance whether we can put that in place, and we are hoping that later this year, because everything has now been worked out, Member, member um, from Maypen, and we are hoping that later this year we can actually start the program. But everything is in place, and so we hope that will happen. Madam Speaker, the justice centres across the island are being improved, all the justice facilities. And Madam Speaker, since I've been Minister of Justice, what I can tell you, you don't hear of courts being breaking down. And the reason, Madam Speaker, is that we ensure that the facilities are maintained. And Madam Speaker, every May, including the beginning of yesterday, I asked the Court Administration Division to confirm that every air condition, elevator, um, other electronic equipment have been maintained or serviced since the beginning of the year because the summer period is coming up and it's heat in the courts and if any air condition breaks down the court will have to be locked down but what I can say for the last two years and I hope this year that no court will break down because any equipment has broken down the truth, Madam Speaker, is that maintenance is a very important part of court efficiency. <laughs> Things must be maintained, and I hate to use a few minutes to make this point, Madam Speaker. I'm trying to tell the court staff, you need to maintain everything. I go down and put in brand new elevators at the Supreme Court, Madam Speaker. After a year and a half, I went down there. I say to one of the property managers, when last have you maintained this court, this elevator? And he looked at me, Madam Speaker, and said, what in a breakdown yet, sir? <laughs> and this is the problem in this country, Madam Speaker. We maintain nothing. We wait until they break down. And it's necessary, not only in the courts, but across all justice sector, all sectors of the government building, we need to maintain everything so that they can last. Madam Speaker, I need to touch on a few other agencies before time runs out. The Administrator General's Department, Madam Speaker, is one of the shining departments of the Ministry of Justice. During the course of the last year, they closed 434 estates and passed on the, transferred all the assets to the beneficiaries, exceeding their target of 400. 350 new estate cases came to the department. And Madam Speaker, they are working efficiently and expect to close over 800 estates this year. And I certainly hope that that will be done.
Madam Speaker, the Legal Aid Council is doing yeoman service in ensuring that persons who need legal assistance, legal aid as they call it, actually get legal aid. And Madam Speaker, this is one minister who can say that every legal aid attorney or every attorney doing legal aid, that they get their money. We don't order anybody any. This minister ensure This minister ensure that the debts are paid. Every February, Madam Speaker, for the last three years, I've been looking at the ministry's financial area and say, what money you have there, let us make sure we don't finish the financial year without our debts being paid. So I can tell you, Madam Speaker, we don't owe any judgment debt. We pay them up. And Madam Speaker, around February, March, we have to be begging the contractors, send in your certificate. Yes. Because we have money. Yes. And Madam Speaker, this is how this minister intends to operate, make persons feel confident that they can deal with the Ministry of Justice. Yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker, the Office of the Public Prosecution have contributed significantly to the Ministry's mandate of protecting the constitutional rights and freedoms of our citizens. The DPP and her team were able to dispose of more than 1,200 cases across the various circuit and gun courts island-wide, adding to their excellent track record of delivering effective and just prosecutions in criminal proceedings. In November 2020, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution partnered with the Jamaica Constabulary Force to launch a training video entitled Digital Police in Criminal Investigations in the technological era. That explores the three investigative tools available to the police under the Cyber Crimes Act. This training tool, Madam Speaker, will assist them to gather computer material for any criminal offense and enhance their capacity to use their investigative powers under the Act. Madam Speaker, the DPP and the JCF are working very closely and in partnership to ensure that cases are dealt with expeditiously. I would like to thank, Madam Speaker, the United Kingdom Department of International Development, DFID, for providing the justice system with more funding to support and strengthen our prosecutorial services. Madam Speaker, it is now and should be known that the, all the clerk of courts will be brought under the DPP. In other words, the prosecution in the parish courts, the clerk of courts will now be prosecutors not clerk of court, so they will probably be known as assistant crown counsel, and they will come under the jurisdiction of the DPP and no longer under the parish court judge. And they basically, Madam Speaker, with the help of DFID, who is providing the consultant to make sure that is done, we can get better efficiency in completing prosecution in the parish courts. Madam Speaker, there's one area which I urge the DPP to address, and that is the question of plea agreement and negotiations. The truth of the matter, Madam Speaker, is that once a file is completed and ready for trial, as is the practice in the United States, where some 90% of cases are completed by plea bargaining, the prosecution should engage defense attorneys to bargain the completion of the case by a lesser charge and or a lower sentence. Naturally, Madam Speaker, for serious matters, the sentence has to be within the normal range and at the higher level, as I pointed out earlier, taking note that both charge and sentence would have to be approved by the presiding judge. Madam Speaker, the plea negotiation is one which I think is not being fully utilized, and I am urging prosecutors to give more attention to plea bargaining to reduce the backlog in the courts. Madam Speaker, this leads me to return again to the matter of sentences. I have heard the cry of our people that some of the sentences being imposed for certain offenses are mere slaps on the wrists of criminal offenders, given the, given the serious nature of their crimes. However, Madam Speaker, I strongly believe that after a guilty verdict, there should be a sentence hearing where the sentencing judge hears presentations from both the prosecution and defense attorneys before imposing sentence. Regrettably, Madam Speaker, in most cases, it's only the defense attorneys who make a plea. 
But I do believe that the concerns and feelings of the victims and the families of the victims should also be taken into consideration by the trial judge before sentence is imposed. Because if that is not done, Madam Speaker, the right of appeal, which we will be coming to with shortly, will not, will be utilized too much. So it's important that both the prosecution and the defense make their presentation and the judge so decide. Madam Speaker, in the area that the Ministry of Justice is responsible for is legislation. And in truth, Madam Speaker, there are many pieces of legislation which are basically tied up, moving like ring a ring of roses between the Ministry, AG's office, CPC, various agencies giving information. People believe that legislation is easy. But the truth of the matter, Madam Speaker, it moves around the mulberry bush before it actually comes to me at Legislation Committee in order for it to be approved and actually tabled in the House. The truth, Madam Speaker, is that I am working assiduously on these legislation and all the ministries are being contacted almost on a weekly basis to see where the legislations are. And in this fiscal year, Madam Speaker, I have no doubt that we will have many, many more pieces of legislation coming to this Parliament. For the Ministry of Justice, we have this right of appeal, and as I indicated, the criminal records um, for expungement. And Madam Speaker, another area which will come to us here shortly is a mediation act, because a mediation act is absolutely important to operate not only commercially, in the courts, but also in the communities, Madam Speaker. Far too many communities engage in conflicts which can be settled by restorative justice and our mediation. And I certainly hope, Madam Speaker, that when we roll out mediation and, con and further roll out restorative justice, that persons within the communities, our families, our gangs, can utilize them in order to settle their differences rather than to engage in abuses and violence. Madam Speaker, there's so much that could be dealt with, but as I indicated, we are doing human service at the Ministry of Justice, ensuring that justice is delivered to the people of Jamaica. Not only do we have mobile buses, three of them now, that can go into communities. So, members of parliament, if you know of a community that need a bus to visit so that your member can have face to face, we have these mobile buses, just book them. There's no doubt, Madam Speaker, that during the past year, because of the pandemic, it has been downsized. But the truth is that we can do it virtually so that members can come to the constituency office, and I hope all of you now have virtual in your constituency office, and talk with a lawyer who is in the mobile bus. And so this sort of discussion can take place virtually. So the individual who need legal advice in the community can make contact with the mobile bus, Madam Speaker, and an opportunity can be arranged for legal service to be done virtually, because we have the opportunity for to deliver service across Jamaica without your constituents having to come to a lawyer or come to the Ministry of Justice or even this time for the bus to go there. But sure, we will also want eventually for the buses to come to your constituency office or come to various churches or communities in order to deliver justice services. Madam Speaker, let me conclude. The team at the Ministry of Justice has faithfully discharged their duties as the lead administrators of justice in Jamaica. I have been impressed by their agility and dedication as they responded to the demands of the pandemic and continued to deliver efficient customer service to justice stakeholders across the island. In particular, I take this opportunity to acknowledge the stellar work of the Ministry's Finance and Accounts Division as it relates to the settlement of judgment debts. In 2020-2021, fiscal year, 646 million was paid out in a settlement of 176 matters. We continue to execute due process for sums awarded in the course of justice 
as this is a true indicator of a first-class justice system. Madam Speaker, my team and I have approached this new fiscal year with confidence and a deep commitment to play our part to foster safe, cohesive and a just society. For now, we will continue to virtually provide those services and support that cannot be done in person. But Madam Speaker, to quote local singer Coffee, when the quarantine thing done and everybody touch road, we are primed and ready to continue to take justice to the yes, people sir. land we love. So Madam Speaker, a lot has been accomplished, a lot more needs to be said. Very shortly, we will be handing over the Director of Public Prosecution Offices, which will be a first-class facility to the DPP. You may have seen some pictures, Madam Speaker, we are visiting the DPP's office. And she's so pleased to say, when you're going to give everything to me. <laughs> and I suspect, Madam Speaker, by July or August this year, we will have it all over to her. I want to thank you, Members of Parliament, for your attention. I now call on the Honorable Pernell Charles Jr., Minister of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment, and Climate Change. To Minister Charles. Madam Speaker, I rise to make my inaugural sectoral contribution to this Honourable House with a sense of purpose, cognizant of the enormity of the task entrusted to me by the Most Honourable Prime Minister as this government steers our nation through perilous times. Madam Speaker, first and foremost, all thanks and praise to the Almighty for his continued grace and favor in my life. I thank our Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, for his confidence in my ability to lead a ministry with such critical, critical and far-reaching portfolio areas also, Madam Speaker, I do not take for granted the support and advice of my cabinet and parliamentary colleagues. Rather, I remain steadfast in the commitment to work together with all to advance equity and empowerment in the best interest of the people. Having served four years in the Senate, my transition to this honorable house was marked by a collage of triumphs and trials that have brought me to this moment. Of note, I have cherished the opportunity to enter this honorable house with my father smiling from the speaker's chair. So great, Madam Speaker, is his call for gender equity that he would convince my sister, Dr. Michelle Charles, to trod the narrow path to Gordon House in a win that I am certain pleased him abundantly. Madam Speaker, I thank my exceptional mother who taught us to care and to serve without expectation of favor. I thank my siblings, campaign team, friends, all who encouraged and advised me. But special thanks, Madam Speaker, to my wife. She is the glue. She is the glue that binds our family. And to my children who, even at their tender age, express a sense of duty to serve. Madam Speaker, 
permit me, permit me also to acknowledge my capable and experienced permanent secretary, Dr. Alwyn Hales, who leads the hardworking staff at the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change, along with our agencies, chairpersons and board members. I thank my constituency staff, Natasha May, Karine Alman, Natavia Burke, and my executive staff, including advisors Binley Sangster, Jason McNeish, Senator Scott, Special Assistant Raquel Hudson, Abigail Smythe, and Secretaries Melise and Kerian, my CPOs Leon Latte and Rami Newsom, and my driver Henry Willisy. I, however, Madam Speaker, reserve my heartfelt thanks to the constituents of South East Clarendon. <laughs> Madam Speaker, they placed their trust and confidence in me not once but twice throughout one of the most challenging times in our history. They have made me, Madam Speaker, a two-term member of Parliament in a matter of six months. <laughs> An unprecedented political milestone. And my presence here would not be possible without their continued support. To their interests, I remain wholeheartedly committed. I acknowledge the unwavering support of former Member of Parliament Rudyard Spencer, my friend, and the sweat and effort of my party workers led by His Worship the Mayor, Winston Mirage, Carlin Benjamin, Colin Koch, and the late Milton Brown, as well as the unprecedented support from colleagues across the country who came in from all over, my JLP colleagues, and gave their support. Madam Speaker, our challenges are interconnected, and so too are the integrated solutions that are required. The garbage and plastic bottles we threw out the car window are later consumed by the birds and fishes, the same ones that we eat. What this illustrates is that there are a myriad of challenges complicating each other. What happens on the ridge shows up on the reef. Land impacts ocean, and in turn, ocean impacts the land. It is all connected, Madam Speaker, colleagues, and in the end, it is affecting us directly. Fishing gear and scandal bags that are improperly disposed will eventually trap and kill thousands of marine life, damage our coral reefs, reduce available fish stock, and ultimately impact jobs and livelihoods. We have to develop solutions to address the way we use our natural resources and how we live in harmony with the physical environment. It is the same interconnected way. Madam Speaker, my theme for today is Renew Jamaica. And there has never been a more urgent need for renewal. As we tackle the multiple pandemics of COVID-19, crime, and climate change, this government considers this moment not just a time of crisis, but an opportunity for us as a nation to rise up stronger and smarter. It is an opportunity to redefine our approach to the provision of shelter solutions by providing accessible, affordable, and climate resilient housing. To reinvigorate our urban centers in order to enhance economic viability and environmental sustainability. To restore the environment and to reduce the impacts of climate change so all Jamaicans can realize a better quality of life. We want to turn this crisis into opportunity through our innovation. And our ministry will be working to empower all Jamaicans to be a part of the solution. To this end, we celebrate the efforts of partners like Project Save Our Reefs, who create innovative environmental solutions by repurposing waste Madam Speaker, they take waste and turn it into sculptures that end up as artificial reefs and serve as nurseries for corals and other marine creatures. So too, the Alligator Head Foundation. We have partners across Jamaica. Yes, they're working on it. Taken together, each distinct portfolio, housing, urban renewal, environment, and climate change, outlines a pathway for the country to thrive in the post-COVID era. 
This government, Madam Speaker, has the roadmap to renew Jamaica. Madam Speaker, we move to the existential threat of climate change. As far back as 2013, it was projected uh, that as early as 2023, Kingston will be one of the first places on earth to see a significant increase in temperature, making it unbearably hot to living, a tipping point. Madam Speaker, if we haven't learned anything from this year, it is that when we hear these projections from our scientists, take them seriously. It is projected then that every year after 2023 will be hotter than any previous year on record. And this is a serious threat to our ecosystems and our way of life. Climate change threatens the very economic base on which we seek to build our country. Cognizant of this, Madam Speaker, colleagues, my ministry is moving to advance progress in building the country's resilience to climate change. Indeed, we have accomplished much and there's much more to accomplish. One of the major successes in 2020 was the completion of Jamaica's updated nationally determined contribution, which was submitted to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change last June. This, colleague, specifies Jamaica's climate actions, our policies, our measures that the government commits to in terms of implementing a response to climate change. Jamaica, we have updated the NDC to include reducing emissions in the energy, forestry, and land use sectors. And the level of ambition, as stated by our Prime Minister in the Climate Summit for Jamaica's unconditional commitment, has increased by more than 60% when compared to the updated NDC, between the updated NDC and the first NDC. We are making progress, Madam Speaker, in the avenue of climate action. Jamaica received support under the NDC Partnership Climate Action Enhancement Package to implement activities to complement our NDC enhancement. This work, Madam Speaker, informs the output of 11 sub-projects of the CAPE program. All projects are scheduled for completion in 2021, and it includes the development of our long-term low emissions and climate resilient develop development strategy. It includes the assessment, Madam Speaker, of climate expenditure analysis and modeling to support the introduction of climate change budget tagging now being pursued by the Ministry of Finance and Public Service. And also, it includes research and the technology development agenda. Moving to technology, Madam Speaker, we have advanced a technology needs assessment for climate change. We have identified 187 potential technologies that could, could work and shortlisted it to 10 for the agriculture, Minister Green, coastal resources, water, and energy sectors. A barrier analysis was conducted to identify constraints to technology diffusion in Jamaica. And from that analysis, Madam Speaker, an action plan was developed to remove these barriers and constraints. To give an example, electric vehicles will become a major feature in our transport mix in the future for Jamaica. Madam Speaker, a very important partnership is going to be developed between the Ministry and UNICEF. And that partnership has resulted in my being able to circulate in, in the bags which colleagues will receive a publication uh, on the effect of climate change on the children of the Caribbean and Latin America. This is a welcome addition to our resource bank, Madam Speaker. We are all aware that the COVID pandemic has had and will have a significant impact on our young population. We have yet to determine the impact. Climate change will also continue uh, to have a yet unspecified impact. And so it's important for us to work together with international partners to utilize the technical expertise and to make sure that we are preparing to adapt and to prepare our youngsters. Madam Speaker, during this financial year, Jamaica will have access to 1.1 million US 
granted from the Green Climate Fund to commence preparation of Jamaica's first national adaptation plan. This plan will include a private sector engagement strategy, a finance strategy, and an investment plan for adaptation. Madam Speaker, we also have a pilot project, a pilot of the Local Climate Adaptive Living Facility, local, which seeks to strengthen the capacity of our municipal corporations to integrate and finance climate action, and this will be tested. Preparatory work for this pilot commenced um, in the last financial year and will be significantly advanced in this fiscal year. What is clear, Madam Speaker, is that more is being done as it relates to climate change than you know. And we are going to work assiduously to ensure that Jamaica is in tune with all the work being done by our climate change division. Madam Speaker, Jamaica is at the forefront of the global discussion on climate action. And I want to acknowledge the hard work of Una May Gordon and the committed team in the Climate Division team from our ministry. Madam Speaker, on Earth Day, April 22nd, 40 leaders from across the world were selected, invited to the Leaders' Summit on Climate, hosted by US President Joe Biden. Our Prime Minister was one of the 40 world leaders that was asked not just to participate, but to present at the summit. <laughs> Governments, including Jamaica, are urged to take concrete actions to keep global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. This is a goal that was set under the 2015 Paris Agreement. The summit highlighted the need for greater access to climate financing and of course, Madam Speaker, we have to acknowledge the selection of our Prime Minister as one of only three selected by the UN Secretary General to lead the entire planet on the discussion of climate financing. Madam Speaker, we are leaders internationally and regionally. Jamaica chairs the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. I represent Jamaica on the NDC partnership as co-chair with the Right Honorable Alok Sharma, who is going to be the president of COP26 in November um, and is from the United Kingdom, my counterpart. Um, and this NDC partnership is a global coalition, colleagues, of 193 members, including countries and institutional partners. And it is the pivotal platform across the globe as it relates to climate change and the discussion on the nationally determined contributions. Madam Speaker, again, while there's much to be done, we have to be proud of the strong voice and leadership of Jamaica on the global stage. Madam Speaker, now more than ever, we need to give special attention to economic recovery. The kind of economic recovery that fosters the building of climate resilience and long-term sustainability. Madam Speaker, in this regard, the NDC Partnership Economic Advisory Program <coughs> will provide expertise of an embedded technical advisor to be placed at the Planning Institute of Jamaica. This advisor will support our efforts in analyzing the socio-economic impacts of COVID-19 and assisting in developing a comprehensive medium-term recovery plan and strategy to address the findings from the post-COVID-19 impact assessment in line with our enhanced NDC. Madam Speaker, I move swiftly through to the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. And again, Jamaica leads the world by becoming the first country in the world to begin the process of developing a predictive climate risk assessment planning tool for major infrastructure areas under the global private sector-led coalition for climate resilient investment. Madam Speaker, this tool will enable us as decision makers 
to assess climate risk to Jamaica's infrastructure networks, to visualize hotspots of high levels of economic and social value at risk in relevant times. Um, and Madam Speaker, we will begin testing this tool in June 2021. Madam Speaker, I move to the natural environment. Strengthening climate resilience and our environmental health go hand in hand. As such, the ministry and its agencies continue to be proactive and vigilant in advocating and promoting the policies and laws that govern and protect our environment. At the ministry, Acting Chief Technical Director Gillian Guthrie and the team are working assiduously to develop a robust policy and legislative framework to address the sustainable use of our natural resources and the preservation of the environment. These policies, Madam Speaker, do not exist in a vacuum. They have real world multi-sectoral application that impacts our country and by extension the lives and livelihoods of all of our citizens. During the 2020-2021 financial year, the Ministry made significant progress in advancing a number of environmental policy instruments and programs. The details will be in the booklet, but I'll just mention a few. In this financial year, we will finalize the Green Economy Investment Strategy for Jamaica. I know that Minister Shaw will be happy to hear that. This will promote green investments as a crucial element of the post-COVID-19 recovery. We will be advancing, Madam Speaker, a number of policies as well. The National Policy for the Environmentally Sound Management of Hazardous Waste, which is aimed at reducing the deleterious effects of hazardous waste on human health and environment, Minister Tufta. We'll be advancing the biosafety policy for Jamaica, geared, toward, geared towards any potential risk to human health and environment from development, transboundary movement, handling and use of living modified organism. We will be advancing a critical policy, which I am sure the public will be interested in, the beach access and management policy for Jamaica, Madam Speaker with a view to increasing access to the public of our beaches across the island and improving the standard of beaches that are accessible to the public. Madam Speaker, the Ministry is also pursuing two very critical policies which are intended to provide a comprehensive and integrated approach to, up, to advance Jamaica's air quality and climate change agenda. These are the Emissions Policy Framework for Jamaica and the update of the Climate Change Policy Framework for Jamaica. For the year ahead, the Ministry will continue to enhance the country's environmental policy framework, and this will include developing, with the support of the United Nations Development Program and the Global Environment Program Project, um, an environmental policy for Jamaica it will include the advancement of, of protected areas policy for Jamaica. It will include a watersheds management policy for Jamaica, Madam Speaker. And in the environmental legislative framework, we will be pursuing amendments to the Natural Resources Conservation Authority Act to address the issues relating to fines and offenses, revocation of permits and licenses issued by the authority, contaminated lands and remediation, and the criteria for environmental impact assessments and performance bonds, among others. Madam Speaker, the Ministry will finalize amendments to our Wildlife Protection Act, and we will be pursuing the promulgation of regulations under the NRCA Act to govern environmental impact assessments. In collaboration with our Forestry Department, we will also work on the amendment of the Forest Act and Forest Regulations to ensure that they are aligned with the tenets of the forest policy for Jamaica. Madam Speaker, as it relates to legislation, we will also be finalizing a process that was started many, many years ago to establish, once and for all, a legislative framework for the practice of meteorology in Jamaica. And this will facilitate a regulated environment for the development of weather and climate services in our country. I'll speak further on that, Madam Speaker.
Madam Speaker, as it relates to protected areas management, managing our protected areas is critical for safeguarding our biodiversity, maintaining the health of ecosystems, building resilience to climate change, and allowing for the sustainable use of our natural resources. In collaboration with NEPA, the Ministry will seek to finalize the Natural Resources Conservation Protected Areas Regulations, which will further strengthen the governance and management arrangement for the country's protected areas. We're looking at the Black River protected landscape and seascape, and moving towards the Pedra Keys and surrounding waters as a protected area under the NRCA Act. Madam Speaker, two years ago, my colleague, Minister and Member of Parliament, the Honourable Daryl Vaz, in his former capacity, announced the government's ban on specific categories of single-use plastic packaging materials. This was a pivotal decision given the fact that 15% of all municipal solid waste generated in our country is non-biodegradable plastic. In January of this year, the government implemented phase three of the ban. And Madam Speaker, since then, we have had and held rigorous consultations with a wide range of stakeholders in the public and private sector. In February, I updated the parliament on the implementation of the ban and we reaffirmed the government's commitment to work with stakeholders throughout the six month transition period, which comes to an end, I remind you, on June 30th of this year. Madam Speaker, Cabinet gave approval during the last financial year for the implementation of a 10-year national program to address the over 2 million end-of-life tires at the island's disposal sites. Madam Speaker, the approval involved the removal of those tires to the Caribbean Cement Company for disposal in its high temperature kilns. Implementation of this program is critical to our development, Madam Speaker. It will not only reduce the cost to store them, but it will also deal with some of the serious health and environmental risk associated with their storage, including potential fire hazards, as well as the mosquitoes. Madam Speaker, the program is a partnership between the government through MUREC, the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change, and the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. And I want to acknowledge the leadership and stewardship of my colleague Minister, Minister Desmond Mackenzie, and his agency, the National Solid Waste Management Authority. Madam Speaker, further to Cabinet approval, we will be commencing at the Ministry the development of a resource efficiency program within the public sector. And the goal is to promote environmental stewardship. Madam Speaker, the program is design, designed to facilitate the procurement of environmentally friendly products, to encourage recycling, as well as uh, to increase the conservation and efficiency of the utilities use within the sector. Successful implementation of this program in the public sector will be used as a model to expand it across the private sector. Madam Speaker, partnership is essential if we are to achieve our goals as it relates to the environmental and climate change agenda. The goal, the goal at our ministry is to build out a national network, Madam Speaker, one that will allow for us to provide guidelines to schools churches, communities, and how they can play their part. To provide support to our colleagues in Parliament and how they can play their part to integrate practices within their own constituencies. We all have to work together, Madam Speaker, if we want to renew Jamaica. So far, Madam Speaker, uh, we have a hundred companies that have been invited to what will be our first discussion on developing the network across corporate Jamaica. And Madam Speaker, each of the parliamentarians in this house 
will be receiving this card. It will be in your booklets. Madam Speaker, I present to you the Earth Card. The Ministry will be providing an allocation to each parliamentarian, starting with 100 seedlings, for you to be able to execute activities in your constituency. And we look forward to you, Minister Tofta, to you, Minister Chang, and to all parliamentarians going to the forestry department and giving their support by buying further, allocating maybe from your CDF or from your pocket, if you are the Prime Minister Andrew Holness, uh, to, to, support, to support our initiative in ensuring that not only parliamentarians, but every Jamaican should be a participant holding an earth card playing their part to achieve the three million and more and understanding as we build out the network to renew Jamaica. Already we're getting um, some requests from Minister Tufton from Food Trees and I've heard him saying that he will be purchasing some Julie mangoes for the constituency. St. Julian. Madam Speaker, as we speak about partnership, we also speak about our youth. And my ministry's Youth Environmental Advocacy Program is currently in its fifth year of implementation. The program aims to empower students aged 9 to 11 to advocate their issues and concerns with respect to the environment. I want to highlight a young man, Madam Speaker, from an institution of which many, um, I don't want to say are envious, but have some concerns. My friends from KC think that they are the college, but there's another college that has produced several leaders. It is called Campion College. And thank you, thank you, Minister. Yes. And I want to highlight the leader of the environmental club at Campion College, who invited me to his online program with hundreds of students. And what it showed me, Madam Speaker, is while we are trying to teach the youth, we should be the one listening to them. They are already on board. They just need a platform to be able to let their voice be heard and to get going with the actions they already want to do. And so, Madam Speaker, the Ministry will be working with the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, with our dear Minister Favel Williams, as well as Honourable Minister of State, Mr. Morgan. Our goal is to build that network, that renewed Jamaica network across every school in Jamaica, every student Minister of Education should be planting a tree. Every student should be recycling a bottle. And if we do so, we will be able to achieve the goal that our Prime Minister, Prime Minister seeks of renewing Jamaica. <laughs> Madam Speaker, Jamaica is preparing for the implementation of the latest transport technology to hit our roads, electric vehicles. The rollout of the support network services such as charging stations, service locations for vehicles and batteries, and the disposal of techno waste must be accompanied by the promulgation of legislation and policies, as well as skills training and public education. Madam Speaker, the Ministry, in collaboration with key stakeholders in the public and private sectors, will implement a project in this financial year, supported by the Global Environment Facility, to assist in the advancement of Jamaica's e-mobility agenda. Madam Speaker, I move quickly to multilateral environmental agreements. The SCARSO agreement, Madam Speaker, is a regional agreement on access to information, public participation and justice in environmental matters in our region. And having participated extensively in the negotiations, Jamaica has signed the agreement and this year 
we will coordinate the consultative process towards Cabinet's consideration of Jamaica ratifying this instrument. Madam Speaker, geospatial technologies. And I jump, Madam Speaker, because we have four portfolio areas and a lot of substance in each. Madam Speaker, in carrying out our mandate of building a sustainable and resilient Jamaica, we rely heavily on geospatial technologies, the modern tools necessary to map and analyze the earth and human societies. And I'm pleased to note the advancements made by Acting Director Raymond Poiser and the team at the National Spatial Data Management branch of our ministry as they manage Jamaica's spatial data infrastructure and promote the use of geospatial tools for the growth of the local geospatial sector. Madam Speaker, the National Spatial Data Management Branch offered critical support in the fight against COVID-19. The branch assisted in developing a COVID-19 dashboard in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and Wellness, mapping COVID-19 cases across the island. From this, the Ministry of Health and Wellness reports to the nation daily on new cases, recoveries, hospitalization, and deaths. And we continue to collaborate with you, Minister Tufton, to enhance mapping and, ana and the analysis capabilities in relation to health hazards and future disease outbreaks in our country. Madam Speaker, I move to National Spatial Planning Information Platform. This is a web-based visualization planning tool designed to complement the National Spatial Plan. Um, and again, Madam Speaker, at our ministry, we understand the importance of empirical data, better information, more accurate information, leading to better policies and better rollout of our plans. Madam Speaker, I return quickly to meteorological services, as I said we would. Many of us do not recognize how important the Meteorological Services Department is. Madam Speaker, in a time when rising global average temperature is associated with widespread changes in weather patterns which lead to more frequent and intense events, the ability for us to forecast weather events is paramount to our effort to become more resilient to shocks to our country and our economy. This change in weather demands that we have access to better forecasting through better technology. And I'm pleased, colleagues, to report that the Meteorological Services Branch, our Met Service, is improving its forecasting ability through the acquisition of our Doppler radar, which is a project implemented by the World Bank, and that has been installed at 70-foot tower installed at the Coopers Hill site, as well as a 40-foot diameter antenna and protective radome. Uh, Madam Speaker, also, in addition to the weather radar being installed, the Met Service has over the past year added a number of automatic weather stations to its assets. Our Met Service is collaborating with academia, UAE and other institutions for the development of data transfer technology that will allow it to remotely retrieve and relay information about the existing weather in real time, Madam Speaker, in a monitoring platform within their offices and even on their mobile devices. This technology was previewed last month and is now in the testing phase for implementation early in the current financial year. Madam Speaker, we all know the danger and frequency of bushfires. Madam Speaker, the Ministry is developing or has developed a bushfire warning index model. This is being further tested and fine-tuned and it is done through a project executed by the Caribbean Development Bank. Madam Speaker, the technology is being customized to include uh, the consideration of local climate variables. Our goal is to make sure that we can foresee the likely bushfire starts and provide alerts to initiate 
preventative action. Madam Speaker, a mobile firefighting device was procured and handed over to the Jamaica Fire Brigade, along with handheld GPS devices uh, being made available to each of the island's fire stations. Madam Speaker, I want to take the time to acknowledge uh, Mr. Evan Thompson. Mr. Thompson is... He has served this country for a very long time. He's our director of the Met Service. Um, and, Madam Speaker, he has the distinction of representing Jamaica at the Executive Council of the World Meteorological Organization. This year, Mr. Thompson was elevated to president of the North America, Central America, and Caribbean Regional Association for the World Meteorological Organization. Congratulations to him for his continued service. Madam Speaker, I want to move quickly to the Forestry Department. Over the, over the past several years, Jamaica's deforestation rate has declined, and our current forest cover has improved significantly and is currently at 40%. This is a critical achievement for our climate resilience, given that our forests are one of the biggest reservoirs of atmospheric carbon in the mitigation of global warming and climate change. And let me pause to acknowledge our new, creative, energetic conservator of forests, Mr. Ainsley Henry. Madam Speaker, as a government, we acknowledge environmental sustainability as a driver of economic growth. Simply put, to achieve sustainable development, colleagues, we must develop sustainably. During the 2020-2021 financial year, the Forestry Department focused on implementing and monitoring the four-year budget support program titled Addressing Environmental and Climate Change Challenges Through Improved Forest Management for Jamaica. And this is financed under the, 11, the 11th European Development Fund. And we also acknowledge our partners in that regard. Now, in its third year of implementation, Madam Speaker, its overall objective is to assist the government and people of Jamaica in implementing the forest policy of 2017 and to sustainably manage and utilize Jamaica's forest resources. Our goal is to enhance the social and economic development and contribute to the country's climate resilience. Madam Speaker, the Ministry, in collaboration with stakeholders such as NEPA um, and with our agency, the Forestry Department, we will seek to declare the, area, um, the areas of cockpit country as protected areas under the law, to develop a management plan and also to nominate the area for declaration as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I know Minister Grange uh, would like to hear that. The Forestry Department, Madam Speaker, is doing good work. And they are seeking and actively engaging citizens in this country to help in carrying out their work. Madam Speaker, during the financial year, uh, we are also going to be implementing the Alternative Livelihoods Program, a very important program that will be facilitating the execution of 46 alternative livelihood projects valued at $240 million within communities adjacent to forest areas in 13 parishes. The program includes interventions such as agroforestry, apiculture, rainwater harvesting, craft item production, and ecotourism. During the last financial year, 43 commenced implementation, and a total of 182.6 million has been dispersed. The agency also continued to provide, Madam Speaker, employment opportunities with some 700 people in rural communities close to Forest Island, across the island, being employed as casual workers. Madam Speaker, I turn, as we close on the environmental section, to a program which all of Jamaica should know. Our National Tree Planting Initiative 
aimed at planting 3 million trees across the island over a three-year period. Madam Speaker, the program is already improving the quality of life of all Jamaicans, as well as securing the commitment of the population to support the country's environmental and climate change portfolio. So far, we have planted it in excess of half a million trees with pledges of 1.5 million trees being planted. In this financial year, we anticipate receiving pledges to meet or exceed our target. In furtherance of this initiative, Madam Speaker, I want to announce, as we said, that we look forward to all of the parliamentarians, as I said, not just receiving your earth card, but we look forward to you going to your schools, getting into your communities, and ensuring that you match or exceed the allocation by going to the forestry department and supporting the initiative. Madam Speaker, for the year ahead, the Forestry Department will continue the implementation of the Red Plus program. This is a reducing emissions for deforestation and forest deg degradation readiness project, a critical project funded by the Green Climate Fund. It's going to assist us with capacity building and it will assist us in establishing, Madam Speaker, a planning mechanism to guide the country in becoming Red Plus ready. This is designed to monetize carbon stocks. And I tell you, Madam Speaker, this government is keen on diversifying our opportunities to generate revenue. And if we can adequately monetize these opportunities, our economic framework will be diversified. There are great opportunities in the carbon market and it is our intention at the ministry to ensure that we interrogate those opportunities to the benefit of the government and people of Jamaica. Madam Speaker, I move to the housing portfolio. Owning a home is a universal ambition. It is something that every Jamaican desires and every Jamaican deserves. Now, Madam Speaker, in this time when we are asked to turn your yard to help manage the ongoing pandemic, we are confronted with the vulnerability of those who do not have a safe place to call a home. The member's time for speaking has expired. And Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I ask that the speaker be given an additional 20 minutes to complete his presentation. Minister, it's asked that you be given an additional 20 minutes to complete your presentation. Those in favor? Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, colleagues. I will move swiftly through the uh, housing and urban renewal portfolios. But of course, the information um, is here for you to digest in detail. As I was saying, Madam Speaker, for too many Jamaicans, uh, the safe, legal, affordable solutions that we seek are out of reach. As a government, we have a responsibility and we are focused on ensuring that we design the framework uh, to provide the opportunities for our people to access affordable housing. Madam Speaker, for the first time, we will be able to say in this parliament that we have a comprehensive national housing policy that can address our complex housing challenges. And this will be coupled with the necessary regulatory guidelines and operational procedures to introduce innovation and efficiency in how we build and in the systems that we use to move forward sustainably. Madam Speaker, the draft national housing policy being developed by Chief Technical Director Doreen Prendergast and her team specifically seeks to address the issues relating to access to finance, improving the supply of housing options, and enhancing affordability, while also integrating climate resilience 
and sustainable building practices in how we design and construct our homes. Uh, the policy was stable in Parliament as a Green Paper in 2019, and we are moving quickly, Madam Speaker, to have this policy tabled as a white paper before the end of this fiscal year. Madam Speaker, we are engaging all of Jamaica in this conversation. And last month, the Ministry hosted a series of consultations under the theme, Let's Talk Housing. We engage various stakeholders, including youth leaders, developers, and mortgage institutions. And the draft policy will include the information and recommendations from those consultations. Madam Speaker, our Prime Minister gave us an ambitious target. 70,000 houses in the tenure. And the ministry will play a critical role in achieving this ambitious target. Madam Speaker, we will be, well, mindful of, of what we have to achieve and how we have to achieve it. We will be advancing a climate resilient home design competition. Madam Speaker, the competition intends to engage stakeholders in the housing and construction industries to address some of the challenges being faced in the areas of affordability across social housing and across all sectors. Madam Speaker, we anticipate that the competition will be implemented by the start of the second quarter of this year. And I can also indicate that team members from the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment, and Climate Change are currently engaged in discussions uh, with the team from MEGJC under the Prime Minister's leadership and further to his instruction, uh, where we will also have a competition there that will focus on uh, defining the best fit design for the HOPE houses. Madam Speaker, as we make the call to the construction industry stakeholders to participate in the Climate Resilient Home Design Competition, we recognize their critical role, not only in the housing sector, but to national development. The PIOJ reported that in the last quarter of 2020, the construction sector grew by 6.2%, Madam Speaker, in times when all sectors are being adversely impacted. It is our construction industry that has proven resilient, and I want to hail all who have worked and continue to work in the construction industry throughout this economic downturn. Yeah. Madam Speaker, the perpetuation of informal settlement, of squatting, is, is one of the greatest challenges that we have in the country and connected to so many of our ills. It distances the, the residents in those communities from governance. It creates barriers to policing and barriers to intervention of social services. And that is why, Madam Speaker, we will be focusing our attention on addressing the issue of the informal settlements and squatting across the country. It is our failure to act over time that has facilitated an institutionalized squatting, Madam Speaker. The issue has been acknowledged but never sufficiently addressed. It's a difficult conversation to have, but one which we must engage in, Madam Speaker. And we will be defining a legacy if we leave the Parliament without addressing this issue. Madam Speaker, we have a squatter management policy in our ministry which will assist us in providing a comprehensive solution to this critical issue. In addition to the squatter management policy, Madam Speaker, we are working to develop and to continue, rather, our survey across the country of those areas where we have informal settlements. It is this data that will give us a true picture of the scope and extent of the unplanned settlements across Jamaica. And the goal is not just to have a survey. That's not the outcome that we see. But the information from that survey is to be utilized to assist in defining a solution, medium, long-term, short-term solutions. Um, Madam Speaker, this is a critical issue for the ministry. We have 
completed a total of 25,202 surveys across 219 settlements, Madam Speaker, in Clarendon, St. Anne, Manchester, Trelawney, Hanover, and St. Elizabeth. Data collection has already commenced in St. Mary, Portland, and St. Thomas. The trends extrapolated from the surveys already confirm that squatting in some cases results from the need to be close to economic opportunity, especially in areas where there is an inadequate supply of affordable housing. Madam Speaker, it is all connected, as I said before. Our challenges, and so too the solutions. Madam Speaker, in the last financial year, the Ministry committed assistance through our housing fund to 183 families of over $60 million. But we recognize that the need far outstrips our support by multiples. It's going to take, Madam Speaker, a significant investment and a phased approach for us to adequately solve the shelter needs of the most vulnerable in our country. That's why, Madam Speaker, we intend to call on the Minister of Finance to structure additional support to advance our efforts and, where possible, through the Climate Change Division, we will identify funding for the program um, as a mechanism for building climate resilience. Madam Speaker, colleagues, let us note, in our informal settlements, where we have uh, residents blocked off from social services and policing, yes. these are the same spaces, same residents, that are the most vulnerable, Madam Speaker, to the impacts of climate change, yes. the flooding, the droughts, all in these areas where we have unplanned communities. So as a country, we must take this seriously and understand that the investment in fixing that problem will be an investment in developing our country in multiple ways. It's not just a housing issue. Fixing the issue of squatting and informal unplanned communities will assist in national security, in health, in every sector. As I said earlier, it is all connected, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to quickly look on a very important issue of the rental industry. Madam Speaker, the rental sector is an important element of the housing industry. Why do I say so? When we speak about providing safe, affordable, and legal housing, not everyone can own a home. There are many persons who, whether in transition or whether of their own decision, will be renting. What we have found, Madam Speaker, is that out of the 1,353 complaints that were dealt with by the Rent Services Unit, the majority of those complaints had to do with harassment, arrears of rent, illegal increases in rent, and non-refund of security deposits. What it does is establishes the importance of the amendments we are making to the Rent Restriction Act. Amendments that are going to be proposed will be including, Madam Speaker, once and for all, putting in the Act the issue of security deposit, which I know many Jamaicans don't know is not in the Act right now. It is just a practice and norm. We will be addressing the issue of recovery of possession. Uh, Madam Speaker, for years, uh, several landlords who have sought to, recovery, to recover possession have just abandoned the claims. Council will tell you, because they are completely disheartened and disillusioned by the long delay that they expect in the courts. The amendment will allow for access now to the Rent Assessment Board as an option to be utilized as a tribunal to address issues of recovery of possession. Madam Speaker, also the matter of the notice to quit, another essential aspect of the amendment. Again, for years, landlords have been finding all type of creative ways to be able to get access to their own property. Once and for all, you will be able to use the intention to sell property once validly, once, can, once it can be adequately evidenced, it can be utilized as a valid reason for you to submit a notice to quit to your tenant. 
Madam Speaker, we have had extensive consultations and discussions. Um, and I want to take the time to thank uh, Ms. Paula Parks and Ms. Scarlett and the team for the hard work they have done throughout this period in advancing the rent amendments. We look forward to that coming into operation. Madam Speaker, moving swiftly through, the Ministry is also pursuing amendments in the Real Estate Developers, Dealers and Developers Act. Uh, we are pursuing community interventions, uh, Madam Speaker, um, as we continue research in the housing sector, and we have defined it as the case of Jamaica. We are pursuing also arising out of uh, the passage of Hurricanes Eta and Zeta, uh, the social economic survey and multi-agency assessment that was completed in Bull Bay and Wise Road, Wise Road um, and several others across the country, Madam Speaker, which we find important if we are to build this resilient and sustainable Jamaica that we speak of. Madam Speaker, uh, very important is community regularization. We have initiated a project to review property accounts um, across the country. And in short order, we will submit to Cabinet a proposal for the writing off of smaller outstanding balances so we can put more titles in the hands of Jamaicans across the country. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this is aligned with the efforts of the Housing Agency of Jamaica, uh, where we will also be designing and advancing the HAJ land titling campaign. This will be a pilot project with the, with the support of the NLA to do mass issuance of titles. Currently, the agency has 7,732 titles in its vault. And I am adamant, Madam Speaker, that we are going to take them out of the vault. Every single one that can be issued will be issued to a Jamaica. Madam Speaker, the Jamaica Mortgage Bank, a critical institution of our ministry, which focuses, Madam Speaker, on providing support to those across the housing sector. This year, Madam Speaker, we will continue the efforts for privatization, um, and we can make good news of the efforts of JMB, Mr. Winter and Mr. Shaw and the team, as they remain committed to maintaining the profit in that institution. Madam Speaker, the JMB is a critical part of our national economic recovery, and they have given significant support in this time to the robust construction sector, which has held up and been one pillar throughout this downturn. And I want to acknowledge the good work of the members of the Jamaica Mortgage Bank. Madam Speaker, permit me, as I close off, to also acknowledge the outgoing Managing Director, Gary Howell, from the Housing Agency of Jamaica. Yes, please. He has given sterling service to the Housing Agency. I think it's more than 26 years of his service. And in my presentation, it will show the contribution of the housing agency to the target that we see. Catherine Estates coming up, 1,650. Grange Pen, another more than 1,600 solutions to be developed and more. Madam Speaker, the housing agency has proved vital and the, the partnerships in the housing agency have proved to be vital in our housing sector. And I want to congratulate them for their work and to highlight the need for the housing agency uh, to continue to address the issue of regularizing informal communities. I know that several of my colleagues have communities that need to be regularized. And we will be speaking to you. We welcome you to speak to us. Um, and we'll do so regularization of informal communities as we also address the land titling issues. Madam Speaker, I want to just give one minute to the issue of urban renewal. It's not a new idea. Successive administrations have implemented various interventions relating to urban renewal. But 
this government, Madam Speaker, as we seek to renew Jamaica, will redefine how we see urban renewal. We will ensure that it is not just seen as cosmetic, but as an essential tool in the effort to renew Jamaica. <coughs> Madam Speaker, urban renewal can and will be a tool utilized to renew socially inclusive cities and also to build public safety. Uh, if not for the time, I would go into details. But we invite all of the key stakeholders, such as the UDC and all of the municipal, corp municipal corporations, and we have engaged them and will continue to engage them in the effort to explore opportunities for community renewal. Madam Speaker, when change meets purpose, we can achieve, re achieve renewal. And this renewal demands a firm resolve to integrate resilience and sustainability in every sector, for us to collaborate with private stakeholders and international partners and to engage every Jamaica. Madam Speaker, if half of our people plant one tree at their house on Labor Day, we would have achieved half of our target. If every Jamaican recycles one plastic bottle per week, we would have removed 156 million plastic bottles from our landfills, gullies, and marine ecosystems. If half, half of the corporate era uses rainwater to flush toilets, Madam Speaker, we would save enough money to send several children to school. If we think, act, and do things differently, we are already on our way to a renewed Jamaica. We can do this. We must do this. Our children depend on it. Our country depends on it. Our future demands it. Madam Speaker, I invite every member of this honorable house and all of Jamaica as they watch at home and abroad to join the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment, and Climate Change as we work together to renew Jamaica, land we love. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I now ask that the debate be suspended. Question before the House is that the sectoral debate be suspended. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The debate is suspended. House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to commend the two presenters. Excellent presentations. At this point, Madam Speaker, I ask for the recommittal of statements by ministers. The question before the House is that the item statements by ministers be recommitted. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm going to ask that, uh, whilst being very respectful of the protocol established regarding the distribution of statements when such statements are being made, that the House would excuse me from those protocols when I'm doing the statements regarding the DRMA matters, um, and I, I ask for the understanding of the members opposite. Is there, are you, are you Madam? No, I'm being courteous, Madam. Yes, sir. Yesterday, we had 48 positive cases out of 1,172 samples tested which yields a positivity rate of 4.1%. Madam Speaker, 
the public sector test positivity rate, meaning that the positivity rates utilizing the PCR tests was, however, 7.7%. That, Madam Speaker, is a significant reduction. It points to a trending downwards. But, Madam Speaker, we cannot rejoice uh, in these new numbers. Any such rejoicing would be premature. Madam Speaker, based on the latest report from this morning, our cumulative cases of COVID-19 are now at 46,087, with 21,646 having recovered. Our recovery rate is therefore now 47%. Unfortunately, three persons died yesterday, bringing the total number to 793 persons having lost their lives to the pandemic. And I extend my deepest sympathies to all Jamaicans who have lost loved ones to this terrible pandemic. On the graph displayed for the members who are in, in the House, the blue bars represent the daily number of confirmed cases of COVID-19. The red line represents the seven-day moving average of new cases. And the yellow line represents the seven-day moving average of new hospitalizations. So we are now seeing a well-defined spike, which would have happened, the peak of that would have been between the end of March to early April. Uh, the number of daily infections, as I would have reported today, is now below 50, but this is just one day's report. It could go up again tomorrow. But it, the general trend is heading downwards. So too would be the number of uh, hospitalizations that is he heading downwards as well. So in general, the numbers are trending in the right direction. Madam Speaker, both lines are trending downwards with the number of new cases de declining faster than new hospitalizations, as there is usually a lag between onset of symptoms and hospitalizations. This demonstrates that the measures implemented since the end of February have been effective in slowing down the virus. Madam Speaker, everyone inside this House would have sensed the fear in the population when we saw numbers in the region of 800 per day and the positivity rate going up as high as 39 percent. And we all at that point realized what could have been the impact on Jamaica. We saw briefly pictures and videos being circulated of our wards in some of our hospitals uh, being filled to capacity and overflowing into waiting areas. We heard the cry of patients requiring oxygen and could not get oxygen supplied at the time that it was needed. We heard the calls of our doctors and nurses and uh, the other services that are in the health system that were overburdened, working overtime. Many of us would have got the calls trying to use whatever influence there was. And I'm happy to say that the Ministry of Health acted in a very transparent way in ensuring that every Jamaican, regardless of regardless of social status, was treated in our hospitals. Some were turned away, but turned away to other hospitals. I don't want to use other countries' experience uh, in, in our local debate, but at this point, I think it is appropriate to express 
our own solidarity with the people of India and wish for them. Uh, uh, a quick recovery as they go through a very difficult period and we again recall their kindness to us in providing us with the first of access. Madam Speaker, I don't think that we are too small or inconsequential to also reach out and support countries that are also in need and we are exploring how this could be done. Madam Speaker, uh, if we could have the, the second graph displayed. Madam Speaker, the graph that is about to be displayed There you go. Thank you, <laughs> The second graph being displayed shows Madam Speaker, the second graph being displayed, and I, I would invite the attention of the members, especially the Minister of Health. <laughs> this is a specially prepared graph by the Ministry of Health, and I think it was specially uh, designed and presented by the, the, the CMO, which shows what we describe as the risk levels. Um, the green bar would be a low level risk. The, the yellow bar would be medium level. The amber would be high level, and the red would be very high. In the medium level, risk, you can contemplate opening up. In the yellow level risk area, you would start to plan, but not necessarily open in an expansive way. So there are some things that you could do. In the amber level, you should be at that point planning to restrict movement, control gatherings, and probably starting to contemplate a lot now. In the red, you should definitely start to have the strongest measures possible to control a spread. So if you look at our epi curve, you would see that when we had the outbreak That is the number. Well, so, Madam Speaker, well, let me, let me explain it this way. So, ma Madam Speaker, our, our epic curve, which is the, the white line, shows the number of infections over time. So, if you were to start in March up until September, early September, Jamaica was in the safe zone. After September, after we declared community transmission, you could see that we fluctuated between medium level of risk and high level of risk. In fact, you will recall that we had put in place measures immediately after the events of September. And uh, we managed to control the spike that happened during that time. And we brought things under control again by mid-November. Now, Madam Speaker, from November until 
early February, we were operating just within that medium level risk. And we allowed uh, significant movement. We increased the curfew hours. We went up as high as 10, uh, 10 p.m. at night. We returned our kids to school in a controlled way. Uh, you know, we allowed churches and meetings and we were opening up. And that, Madam Speaker, is what the government has to wrestle with all the time. Put in measures to restrict movement, control gathering, which slows the economy. And uh, as we see the passing of the storm, as it were, then we, as quickly as possible, try to return to some level of normal economic activity. But there is a lesson, Madam Speaker, to be learned from this graph. You cannot open up too quickly. There is also another lesson that we have to pay attention to. If you open up while you are in the high level risk zone or the medium level risk zone, the probability of the spike being higher than it was previously is greater. What that means, Madam Speaker, is that if we were to even contemplate opening up now, the risk of a third wave happening is greater. But not only that, the risk of the third wave being more devastating, certainly in terms of the number of infections and the number of hospitalizations would be greater because you're starting from a much higher level of existing infections in the population. And so we, we have to bear this in mind, and I'm making the point for the population that is now frustrated, impatient, who basically some have just given up in terms of their compliance. And I want to say here, Madam Speaker, that for those who are so frustrated, who are tired of the lockdowns, who want to see things return to normal, whilst I understand your impatience, I understand your frustration, I am urging you to be understanding, to maintain compliance. All that we have to do, Madam Speaker, for those who have eyes to see, for those who are only following only some news on social media, following some influencers on social media, I urge you just for one minute to just look at what is happening globally with other countries and what is happening to them and their populations. And Madam Speaker, I had occasion to speak with my counterpart in Trinidad. And I, we speak on a regular basis and with other members of the CARICOM community to compare what is happening. Uh, and you know, they, they will look at what is happening in Jamaica. They will take some of the things we are doing. We look at what is happening in Trinidad. We take some of what they are doing. And we consider it when we are making our policies. And Madam Speaker, many Jamaicans would not know that Trinidad kept its borders closed. Border is now closed for going close to a year. We opened our borders in June. Trinidad maintained a very low daily case rate, sometimes no cases for a day. And now they are having a spike, almost 300 persons being infected with a very virulent variant, which would be the Brazilian variant. They have their peculiarities. They have a close border with South America, seven miles away from Venezuela. So they have people coming in 
that they may not always have control over, and that may, may be an explanation as to how this would happen with the borders closed. But I'm raising the point, Madam Speaker, that even when there are measures in place, even when the government is enforcing that you can have spikes occurring. The only defense that we have, Madam Speaker, is if every Jamaican acts responsibly. That's the only defense, Madam Speaker. The black line on the graph, which is, shows a kind of step, step graph, shows you our bed capacity since the outbreak in Jamaica. And you can see that the government has been um, consistently stepping up the capacity of beds. And we've, we've now passed 600 beds. We're closer to 650 beds, or probably a little more than that. Uh, 650 COVID beds, beds dedicated for the treatment of COVID patients. And you can see, Madam Speaker, that for March and April, we were in the danger zone. We were in the danger zone when our number of new cases per day, which triggers your hospitalizations, would have been above and in for three or four weeks, well above the number of beds available. Yes, so this is the, the white line is your hospitalization, and the black line here would be the beds. The difference here would be those persons who were not being treated with COVID beds. So what we would have had to be doing would be to displace beds for other services in order to treat the excess patients. So it would have had an impact on the health system. So for example, elective surgeries may have had to be postponed. Persons who would normally have been treated at the hospital for other diseases that may not be considered life-threatening, they may have had to be sent home in order to get those beds to treat the COVID patients. If that situation had gotten out of hand, worse than it did there, then the impact on the health system would have been far greater. And then we would begin to see you know, the, 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 the real implications of persons who need urgent and critical care and treatment having to be arbitraged or triaged, as they call it. The, the medical, bo both, it's, it's actually both, the, because decisions would be made sometimes arbitrary, and decisions would be made according to the, 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 your Hippocratic Oath and medical rules. Luckily, in general, we have avoided that, and we have avoided that because we have put in place the rules as a government, we have mobilized a society that is generally following the rules, but there are still those who are hell-bent on carrying what I think of as a fringe, a, a, a kind of fringe objection to the actions of the government. And though it is, you know, a, a, a fringe movement, it is still dangerous as there are those who will follow it. And it is within that fringe element of objection that you could have outbreaks occurring. So for those people who decide they're not wearing any mask, those people who decide that they're going to still have their parties, it is likely that it is in, in those areas that you're going to have outbreaks that could rise to the level of causing a spike and a third wave. And so in, when I present here in Parliament, Madam Speaker, I thank the reasonable and rational Jamaicans who have decided to get vaccinated, who try to wear their masks, who try to social distance. But we don't live in two Jamaicas 
where those people who decide to comply live in one place and those who are not complying live in another place. We live side by side. So I have to reach out to those persons who still feel that it is an imposition on their freedoms and an imposition on their rights and we're being unreasonable. I still have to reach out to them, appeal to their conscience and their good sense and ask them to come on board with the Jamaicans who are bearing the sacrifice and let us all get through this together as one nation. So Madam Speaker, the next graph that I'm about to, to display uses the same threat levels, risk levels, but it, it shows the R0. And we have gone through what the R0 is. That is the reproductive rate of the virus in a new population. Uh, Madam Speaker, the graph shows that our reproductive rate has been declining, but it is still relatively flat. Um, we, our R not no, Madam Speaker, is below one. Uh, it is hovering sometimes. Uh, between 7 and 9, 0.7 and 0.9. So it's below, below 1, which is good, which, which tells us, Madam Speaker, that one person is infecting less than one person. So, so eventually, if we continue to see the R0 decline, it would mean that there would be less infections taking place. So we are, we are heading in the right direction, but it is too early, Madam Speaker, too early to release the restrictions that have been put in place. Madam Speaker, I wanted to just explain this graph a little bit. The lower we go in the green zone, Madam Speaker, with our reproductive rate, it means that if we were to release some of the restrictions, if we were to increase or rather reduce the curfew hours, allow greater number for gatherings, if we had a reproductive rate which was below 0.5, then it would be probable that if there were to be an event that created a spike, then you would not have that spike quickly emerging into a rapid spread, which we could then call a new wave. So it is important that we get that R0 down to as close to zero as possible. And once we are in that position, then, Madam Speaker, we can contemplate um, reducing movement measures, reducing gathering measures, and possibly taking other steps to return our economy to full production. Madam Speaker, the data clearly shows that tighter measures implemented in the last week of February 2021 20, to now have been very successful in slowing the spread of the virus. And while our hospitalizations are now below our capacity, we are not yet out of the danger zone. The Ministry of Health recommends, Madam Speaker, that we keep the measures that we have for at least three incubation cycles, meaning for at least the next six weeks. So once we are within this green zone, which we are not quite, we are just hovering there, we are expecting that within the next six weeks, we should be well within that green zone, and then we can consider uh, certain measures for relaxation. So, Madam Speaker, I want to prepare the nation 
that though we are having good news, that we are not going to make the error of having any general opening up because that could be dangerous. In, indeed, it could spell disaster. So I'm asking the nation to bear with us for another six weeks. I know it's rough. We're getting the calls, people losing their houses, mortgages coming due, the, you know, the, the, the business sector, particularly the quick service sector, the fast food, the restaurants, they are complaining, not to mention the entertainment industry, they are complaining, you know, the sports industry. We know, we know, we know, we know. But we also know what could happen if we don't take the action that we are doing now. So I'm asking again for your patience. So, Madam Speaker, the existing measures will largely be extended for a four week period until the 2nd of June 2021. We have made some changes, some adjustments. Uh, because of some imperatives which we can't escape. So, Madam Speaker, curfew hours. The curfew hours for weekdays, Monday to Friday, will remain at 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, and they will end, of course, the, on the 3rd of June at 5 a.m. So the normal curfew hours, which would start on 8 p.m. on a weekday, ending 5 a.m. on the following day, this will go on until the 3rd of June at 5 a.m. The curfew hours for the weekend will be modified for the next four weekends. The curfew will now begin on 6 p.m. on Saturday and at 2 p.m. on Sunday. And end, of course, at 5 a.m the following day. So the weekend curfews, Madam Speaker, for the, next, for the next four weeks, the next four weekends, the weekend curfew will start at 6 p.m. on a Saturday and end 5 a.m. on the following Sunday. It will begin again at 2 p.m. on the Sunday and end on 5 a.m. on the following Monday. And this will go on for the next four weekends. For Labor Day, for Labor Day, Madam Speaker, which is celebrated on the 24th of May, but the official date would have been the 23rd, but because the 23rd is a Sunday, uh, the Labor Day would be celebrated on the day following. So on Monday, the 24th of May, 2021, there will be an all-day curfew. So that will be a no-movement day. Therefore, on Sunday, May 23rd, the curfew will begin at 2 p.m. and it will go right through Monday and end at 5 a.m. on Tuesday, the 25th of May. So there will be some adjustments which Minister Grange will announce for Labour Day. There will be labour at home. I certainly will be working at my house. <laughs> so we, we, are, <laughs> so we, are, we are encouraging all Jamaicans to stay home and work at home. The logic behind this, Madam Speaker, just for those who are wondering why, why we are doing this, this is really a compensatory measure because, Madam Speaker, we will have to send our children back to school in order that they are able to do the exams, uh, the exit exams. So, Madam Speaker, the dates, and we know that once this movement happens, you, you may have 
uh, increased numbers. So we are compensating uh, by doing this lockdown almost preemptively. So, <clears throat> Madam Speaker, the dates for exit exams are approaching and our students and teachers continue to face significant challenges with preparations. Madam, Madam Speaker, I had, today, I had occasion to uh, do a little production with uh, some uh, early childhood children for Read Across Jamaica, and their parents were there, and they were so happy to have their children out of the house, even for the hour. They were, they were relieved, they were very happy, and the children were ecstatic, they were beside themselves. They, they really want to go back to school. And of course, they engaged me wanting to know when we can reopen schools. And, and I'm just seeing on their faces the great distress. Uh, one mother pointed out that uh, for her child, she has to stay with the child while the child is uh, on the, the, the virtual platform. Uh, and that finishes at 1.30, and then she has to go to work. And I can, I can only imagine um, the, the struggle. I, I have one uh, child now who is doing CXCs, uh, but you know, he's a big guy, so he can, he can manage. But for all those other children, younger children and parents who have to be there, it has, the pandemic has really uh, presented a major challenge for them. And I want them to know that we understand what is happening we will try to support as much as possible, and as soon as we can allow our children to go back to school, we will. The only way that this is going to happen, however, Madam Speaker, is if we get our population vaccinated. That's the, that's the way. So, Madam Speaker, based on the registration data, approximately 39,000 students are registered to do the PEP ability test for grade six, which is scheduled for May 26, 2021. 13,951 students in the public schools and 101 private candidates are registered to do CAPE. 45,174 students in the public schools and 1,162 private candidates are registered to sit CSEC. These exams are scheduled for June 14th to July 16th, 2021, with orals and practicals scheduled to commence June 1st, 2021. 24,000 students are registered for City and Guilds exams, uh, and this exam is scheduled for August 10th to 11th, 2021, and 16,000 students are registered to sit the NCTVET exams scheduled for June 7 to 11, 2021. So Madam Speaker, you can see that we will have uh, a significant population of our youth moving about in the population. Due to the pandemic, a significant number of the current exam cohort would have lost approximately one year of in-person instruction and guidance. School-based assessments, SBAs, would normally be over 90% complete in the month of March. However, based on the SBA readiness survey conducted on April 8th, only 15% of the CSEC schools and 26% of CAPE schools have over 70% of SBAs completed. So we are in a dire position. Arising from this, the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information wrote to, the, to CXC requesting a further extension of the deadline for the submission of SBAs, and this was granted. So the SBAs now no can be submitted or should be submitted uh, by June 30th, 2021 without penalty. And it was agreed that it could be submitted on a rolling basis. That, that means that as you are completed, uh, a part of it or the whole of it, you can submit. So that way they don't have a, back, a, a pile up of SBAs to mark, that they can start marking as they receive. Uh, of course, Madam Speaker, the, the, the June 30th deadline um, would not apply for all the SBAs. I believe that for, 
for practical minister, there might have been a different deadline. For yeah, there, there, there is a, a different deadline for that. So for project type SBAs, the deadline for submission is uh, June 18th, 2021. Madam Speaker, face-to-face -face engagement for students preparing for the 2021 sitting of the exit examination constitutes a timely and necessary intervention to better enable students to adequately prepare. The Cabinet has therefore given approval for the resumption of face-to-face -face instruction as of Monday, May 10th, 2021, for those students sitting the PEP uh, Grade 6 Ability Test and those in Grades 11 to 13 to sit the Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate, CSEC, and the Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examination, CAPE, the City and Gills, and the National Vocational Qualifications, or NVQJs. Private schools, and, and this would apply for those who are sitting these exams in private schools as well. Madam Speaker, we want to emphasize that the COVID-19 infection prevention and control protocols will be firmly established and enforced in the schools, and we are expecting that there will be strict adherence to these rules within the schools. Provisions have been made through the regional offices for disbursements of grants for basic equipment and material needed for sanitization purposes. Uh, and this would include, Madam Speaker, the, the procurement and provision of masks for students who don't have. A whole day rotation approach based on resources available, that would be space and staffing at schools, is going to be implemented commencing May 10, 2021. And this is to facilitate the inclusion of face-to-face -face engagements for students sitting the 2021 exit exams. This means that only a subset of each cohort of students will be at school each day while others work remotely. So, Madam Speaker, we're not proposing that we will have the entire cohort of, of exam students coming to school all at once. So we, they, they will be given a schedule and they will be able to be rotated in. So the school should be able to utilize all its classroom spaces and the teachers who are there uh, would have to be scheduled in order to deal with them. So the, the schools, Madam Speaker, will be required to be involved in a very high level logistics and planning exercise to ensure that they can comply with the health protocols that are going to be established. But this is also, Madam Speaker, to ensure that we don't have a situation where we have crowding on public transportation by our school children. So we are going to be scheduling it as such that students are able to travel without necessarily having to, to be crowded into public transportation. That was part of the, the consideration. Systems are in place for the teachers involved in face-to-face -face instruction to be vaccinated as part of the infection prevention and control measures. Madam Speaker, two months ago, when we were planning our vaccination, uh, the implementation of our vaccination exercise, we decided that we would include teachers as a priority. Uh, and that was done precisely because we saw that this day would come and we would need to have teachers vaccinated. So, Madam Speaker, approximately 7,500 teachers have already been vaccinated. It's a fairly decent number, still not high enough to give us the satisfaction we would need, but we do have a critical core that uh, could carry the revision classes and the face-to-face -face, um, classes that we need. We have plans in place to vaccinate other teachers, and that will um, commence on May 6, 2021. And we are using this platform, Madam Speaker, to encourage all our teachers, especially those who will be required to conduct the face-to-face -face classes, 
to get vaccinated, the Ministry of Health, in collaboration with the Ministry of Education, uh, would, would have made the arrangements by now, and the, the teachers would have been contacted, and we are, we are urging all our teachers to take advantage of this opportunity to get vaccinated. The, the Ministry of Health and Wellness will ensure that the schools that we are expecting to reopen, more than 355 schools, that these schools will be inspected thoroughly to ensure that they have the protocols in place and that they are maintaining them when the children are in attendance. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information will coordinate with parents and local transport providers to ensure the safe movement of students to and from school. Where there is need for transportation support for students or for families who are experiencing severe financial challenges, this should be communicated to the regional office for special support. We're, we're providing support for our students who will need to travel. Parents will be asked to visit our website as of Thursday, May 6, 2021, to provide information regarding their transportation routes and distance away from schools. This information will help us to finalize specialized support in tandem with our transport providers, including JUTC uh, and Montego Bay Metro. Madam Speaker, except for students sitting exit examinations, as earlier stated, there should be no other face-to-face -face instruction in our public schools or independent schools, primary or secondary or, or post-secondary. Students are instructed to use the other modalities which are in place, which would be the virtual online learning, the, the, um, the audio visuals on TV and, and radio stations, and, uh, and those schools that actually come to your home and, and deliver the books and the worksheets. Those are the modalities that are in use. So let me again use this opportunity to thank all in the education sector to continue to go above and beyond in these unprecedented times. Let me encourage our students to remain focused on their studies and apply creativity, critical thinking, and innovativeness in overcoming the challenges the pandemic has created. These are the skills that will serve you well in all your endeavors, including your examinations. Other measures, Madam Speaker, all other measures remain largely unchanged until the 2nd of June, 2021. So let me therefore quickly go through some of these measures, noting changes where applicable. The control entry protocols. Madam Speaker, the existing protocols, including the requirement for all travelers to present a negative COVID-19 test conducted within three days of travel remain in place, as does the requirement to self-quarantine for 14 days after arrival. I want to emphasize that even though incoming travelers would have presented a negative COVID-19 test, the 14-day quarantine requirement still applies, and this includes persons who are fully vaccinated. There is no exception within our control entry protocols for persons who have been fully vaccinated. Even though you are vaccinated, the science is still saying that you could possibly carry and transmit. Madam Speaker, and, and some people might be saying, then why get vaccinated? So you may, you may be able to carry and transmit, but if you are vaccinated, you have a higher probability of not getting ill and still yet a higher probability of not having a fatal event, or meaning attributable to, COVID. attributable to COVID, meaning that you probably, even if you got ill, you probably would not die from COVID. So, Madam Speaker, I want to emphasize this, that our 14-day quarantine is still in place, and it is still a requirement, and we will still be enforcing against this. Madam Speaker, we note that some countries have issued 
different protocols for fully vaccinated persons. For us not to do so could put us at a competitive disadvantage in the tourism market, particularly in the context of large numbers of persons being vaccinated in our major source markets. So, Madam Speaker, it is not that we are not considering, it is not that we are not looking at the probability and the possibility and the impacts of other countries who have decided that they are going to change their protocols to allow vaccinated persons to enter without quarantine. We recognize that it will place us at a disadvantage. But where we are, Madam Speaker, in the pandemic, we could not at this time, at this stage, when our r naught is still varying between a medium and a low risk, we could not at this time make that adjustment. Madam Speaker, the travel ban applicable to the United Kingdom came to an end on April 30th, 2021, and has not been extended given the significant portion, proportion of the UK population that has already been vaccinated and the consequent reduction in new cases in the United Kingdom. While the UK variant remains a concern, it is notable that it is now the dominant strain in the United States, where we get the bulk of our tourists and indeed the bulk of our travelers, including our Jamaican diaspora, and the United States being the main destination for Jamaicans who are traveling outbound. So following our ongoing review of other countries experiencing a spike in COVID-19 cases, uh, in some cases due to variants, we are extending the travel restrictions that we have to include India and Trinidad and Tobago, effective Wednesday, May 5, 2021, until the 2nd of June, 2021. The travel ban for South American countries, Brazil, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Argentina, and Paraguay is also being extended until the 2nd of June, 2021. Of course, we continue to reassess these as circumstances warrant. Madam Speaker, the age limit for the stay-at-home measure remains at 60 until June 2nd, 2021. This is another area of extensive discussion. Uh, we have spent some time discussing this in the Cabinet. However, at this time, given where we are with our r not, we are not quite in the, in, in the low-risk zone. The position that we have taken is that it is safer to keep our 60 years old under the stay-at-home measure. Work from home, Madam Speaker, the existing work from home directive in the public sector is being extended until June 2, 2021. As a reminder, permanent secretaries and heads of agencies are directed to ensure that only persons who work in critical service delivery and perform job functions that have to be done in office or in person uh, or with physical presence should be um, encouraged to come to work. For the private sector, employees, employers should allow all persons who can work from home to do so. The gathering limit. The public gathering limit will remain at 10 persons until the 2nd of June 2021. However, public entities may now hold events such as, well, let me rephrase this. Public entities may hold events limited to handing overs, launches, groundbreaking, and opening ceremonies, but there should be no more than 15 persons physically present and the requirement of mask wearing and the maintenance of, of physical distance must apply. Madam Speaker, the, the reason for this is that 
we have several projects that we have to launch, officially open, to get them started. And the idea behind it, Madam Speaker, is that all of this should really be done virtually. So the only persons that would be present would be the Minister, the Permanent Secretary, whoever else might be critical to any contract signing and so forth, and it be broadcast and televised. So this is not a license for any event, any large event, no more than 15 persons. And the 15 persons, Madam Speaker, is the same provision for funerals, for, rather for burials and for weddings. So it would be 10 persons in attendance and whatever personnel is needed to do the broadcasting. Markets. Uh, for markets and vending in public arcades and public transportation centers, opening hours will be one hour after the end of the curfew in the morning to one hour before the start of the curfew. Therefore, the curfew ends, therefore, when the curfew ends at 5 a.m., markets will open at 6 a.m. When the curfew starts at 8 p.m., markets must close by 7 p.m. On Saturdays, when the curfew starts at 6 p.m., markets must close at 5 p.m., and markets remain closed on Sundays and public holidays. Public transportation. In terms of public transportation, uh, they will still be allowed to be on the road one hour before and one hour after curfew, but there can be no passengers in the vehicles during this period. Madam Speaker, all persons in PPVs are reminded to comply with the outlined protocols in the order. Funeral services. Funeral services are not permitted during the period ending June 2, 2021. Madam Speaker, we appreciate the emotional strain that this measure is causing, but we have no other option at this time until we see further improvement in our numbers. Burials. Burials will continue to be allowed on Mondays to Fridays during the hours 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. As a reminder, the time for conducting the burial is limited to 30 minutes and only 15 persons of whom a maximum of 10 should be mourners will be allowed. In a previous order, Madam Speaker, we had restricted motorcades for funerals. And uh, I read and I, the, 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 the distressing case of a mourning party coming back from a, a burial and their bus being shot up and two uh, Jamaican women being killed. Uh, and, and, you know, my, my heart goes out to, to, their, to their family. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm not proposing that, you know, these COVID measures can solve crimes. But sometimes I think as Jamaicans, we have to be wise. We have to wise up. Uh, because you not only have a killer virus, but you have people infected with the virus of violence who are even more dangerous than the virus. So we, we just have to be wise in what we are doing. Worship services, Madam Speaker, the maximum number of persons who may be physically present to facilitate worship or electronic broadcast, including the officiating clergy and technical support personnel, remains at 30. And Madam Speaker, as soon as we dip further into that green zone, then we can contemplate increasing the, the numbers in our church. Uh, just, just to point out, Madam Speaker, it, it's interesting, in this version of the, the graph showing the various threat levels, in green, if your R0 is in that area, then your, your, your curve will be heading downwards. Your epidemiological curve will be heading downwards. If you are in the yellow, you're going to have an exponential increase, which, which means that the, 
your, your next increase will probably be a factor of your last increase or sometimes double your last increase. And if you are in the amber, it means that you're going to have high exponential increase. And if you are in the red, you're going to have your numbers shooting up astronomically. So we are just on the edge of decreasing. We're not quite there yet. Anything could push you back into the yellow where you could start to see increases again. So we need to get further down into the green zone. And once we are in, in that zone, then we can contemplate, for example, increasing the, the, the number of worshippers in church. Who knows? Maybe increasing the number for weddings. E even though, Madam Speaker, I, I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm not getting so many complaints about the number for, for weddings. Uh, maybe there is a certain economy at play. But, but you would have heard, Madam Speaker, <laughs> but, but you would have heard from the Minister of Justice, I was listening carefully, that the number of marriage certificates w were quite significant. So people are quietly going about their, their business, Madam Speaker, and, and, and probably saving quite a bit. Madam Speaker, so the, the wedding cap remains at 15. Beaches and rivers that are not under organized management and control will remain closed until June 2nd, 2021. Zoos, parks, gyms, attractions, and bars are subject to the existing restrictions and must close at the designated times until June 2nd, 2021. Amusement or gaming arcades not licensed under the Betting, Gaming, and Lotteries Act must remain closed until June 2nd, 2021. Indoor cinemas and establishments that stage theatrical or artistic performances will remain closed until June, 20, June 2, 2021. The ban on events such as concerts, parties, tailgate parties, round robin, and boat parties, and boat parties will continue until June 2, 2021. Madam Speaker, effective May 5, 2021, annual general meetings or extraordinary general meetings of companies and <clears throat> general or special meetings of cooperative societies, friendly societies, or industrial or provident societies may be held with a maximum of 15 persons present, including technical support personnel. Most importantly, the requirement to always wear a mask to cover your nose and mouth in a public place continues, as well as a requirement to be physically distanced from other persons, especially those not in your household, and to either wash your hands or for at least 20 seconds or sanitize frequently. Those rules must be followed for any gathering that is permitted. Madam Speaker, I want to just quickly mention the delivery economy. Notwithstanding a few teething pains, the e-commerce national delivery system, ENDS, pilot, has been extremely successful. It has, it has enabled a number of quick-serve businesses to continue operating during curfew hours. The demand has been overwhelming, and we will be expanding the pilot program for registration to businesses island-wide by Thursday, May 6, 2021. We are moving quickly to further enhance ENDS to prepare for a full launch to be called ENDS 2.0, which will include a redesigned website and mobile apps, as well as interconnection with other government systems to facilitate proper monitoring and enforcement. Madam Speaker, I want to emphasize that, as has been the case to date, the system will be fully inclusive and enable the smallest vendor to participate. Madam Speaker, I've seen uh, some pan chicken operators benefiting significantly. Uh, they have embraced the technology and the persons are seeing the business opportunity. But what we have discovered, Madam Speaker, is that while 
we in this house appreciate the technology and the formation of the digital society. We still have a far way to go to explain this to the average man on the street so that he can understand that his business too can be a part of the digital platform, the digital society. So what we have discovered here in, in uh, um, the, the rollout of the ends is that we have to give greater support both in terms of financial literacy but also in terms of digital literacy to the small business operator. We have to literally, Madam Speaker, go out, embrace them, coach them, hold their hands, and probably even give some kind of incentive for them to participate. And so a, 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 a positive um, spin-off of the ends is that, Madam Speaker, we are now discussing from a policy perspective how we can ensure that all Jamaicans, including the smallest business person, can be included in our financial digitization efforts. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the Minister of Finance announced that the Bank of Jamaica will be very soon launching our digital currency. We don't want the digital currency, Madam Speaker, to be the exclusive enclave of the rich and those who are native to the digital society. We want the average Jamaican to benefit from the convenience and mobility of digital currency. So we are going to be pushing even harder to ensure that the people in coronation market are <coughs> wherever in Jamaica. Red Hills Road, Grand Spen, Christiana, that they too can realize the benefit and convenience and safety of using the digital currency. Madam Speaker, up to the end of April, approximately 140,000 persons had received the first dose of the vaccine. On April 26, 2021, we received an additional 55,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine from the global COVAX facility. The vaccination program continues to be targeted at any member of the priority groups who have not yet received their first dose, as well as providing the second dose to those who are now due. As a reminder, our priority groups are persons 60 years and older, healthcare workers, the JCF, JDF, PICA, Department of Correctional Services, the Jamaica Fire Brigade, and our teachers, especially those who instruct students who will be sitting external examinations and will be returning physically to school as of May 10th. Madam Speaker, the government continues to pursue all avenues, bilateral, multilateral, as well as commercial arrangements with suppliers to obtain further vaccine supplies. Madam Speaker, I wish to say that it would be the greatest travesty to humankind if vaccines that are currently in storage for strategic reasons were allowed to expire or come close to expiration before they are made available. And I am not asking necessarily for gifts, but to purchase as well. And I think great consideration should be given to the emergency that exists now with small, poor countries like Jamaica that are essentially at the mercy. You know, we are practical people, Madam Speaker. We understand that those who have the vaccines, those who produce it, they're going to make sure that they get their population vaccinated. But it is quite another thing, Madam Speaker, when you have supplies that, yes, you might be holding them for strategic reasons, but I think where we are at now, 
the greater strategic benefit would be to ensure that the wider population outside of your country, with, near your borders, that those markets, those economies, those societies can see hope for recovery as well. That will certainly ensure a stronger recovery for the world. Madam Speaker, we are starting to see an improvement in our case numbers and hospitalizations. But there is absolutely no room for complacency. The experience of other countries, and indeed our own experience, should serve as a warning that we cannot dispense with caution and we cannot become complacent. Otherwise, this will lead to catastrophe. While we continue our best efforts to obtain and further uh, advance vaccinations in our country, we must ensure that we utilize the ultimate vaccine. And the ultimate vaccine is our personal responsibility. The ultimate vaccine is for every single Jamaican to observe the public health protocols which have served us all very well. The ultimate vaccine is knowledge and information that changes behavior, particularly for those who exist on the fringe of our society and for those who are influential within our society, but preach a message against reason that is selfish and endangers the life and livelihood of all Jamaicans. <laughs> Madam Speaker, as I close, I want to commend and thank our health workers and our security forces. Uh, I think they have behaved and conducted themselves with uh, the security forces with great restraint and professionalism in handling the matters of the pandemic. And as usual, our public health workers have been very committed, and I want to acknowledge them. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I thank the Prime Minister for his presentation. And like him, I am repulsed by the idea of stockpiles of vaccines in the rich world being allowed to expire or nearly expire and not being made available to countries that need vaccine, want vaccine, are prepared to pay for their vaccine. And I really hope that that will not happen and that good sense will prevail and a moral and ethical approach will be found. And of course, we're encouraged by recent announcements by President Biden's administration that they would be providing, I think, 60 million um, doses of vaccine to other countries. I don't know at what terms, but at least they're willing to provide those. And we hope that that will be the first of um, more to come. And like the Prime Minister, I wish to express my sympathies and solidarity with the people of India who are going through this terrible time uh, with what appears to be a particularly virulent strain that has taken them by surprise and put them in an awful crisis there. Madam Speaker, the, <clears throat> the question of the extension of the existing COVID-related restrictions for another six weeks, I think, it's a difficult situation that we're in. We're glad to see the graphs. Uh, as the Prime Minister indicated, the numbers do bounce around quite a bit from day to day. And um, though we, as was mentioned, for example, today, 48 new cases, 8.5% positivity of the public sector uh, testing. I mean, if we look at yesterday, there were 172 new cases, 
six deaths, 21.2% positivity. The day before that, there were 90 new cases, five deaths, 12.7% positivity. And the day before that, 199 new cases, one death, 21% positivity. So the numbers are bouncing around, although the trend line appears to be in the right direction. And I think there's no doubt that the gathering restrictions and the mask wearing has been important in bringing this under control and people's sense of personal responsibility and compliance generally with sensible rules has been having a positive effect. The, move, the restrictions on movement are a little more controversial, Prime Minister, the curfew in particular. I know many people would have liked to have heard some relaxation of the hours of the curfew. I know, for example, there's a view that having the curfew beginning earlier tends to force people to go about their business in a shorter space of time. And that is itself conducive to congregating and some amount of bungling in places like supermarkets and transportation <coughs> uh, vehicles and what have you. Whereas if they were a little bit more relaxed, in turn, people would have more time and there'd be less bungling. And I, I'm not sure what the logic is for restricting the, 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 the movement, though I understand the, the gathering restriction. I know some of the restriction of movement is prudent, but the thinking behind it is less compelling, I think, uh, especially when you're talking about restrictions on movement, which are, um, for example, on a weekend, 6 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and on an everyday basis, 8 o'clock. The living conditions in communities such as where, which you represent, which I represent, many of us represent, it is very difficult for people to come off the road and go into their homes at 8. It's hot and unpleasant, and many people feel extremely strongly that this is an unfair requirement on them. The change in the law that we recently enacted, which was to remove the need for a warning before persons can be arrested and charged for breaching things like the curfew and the mask wearing and what have you. That was to some extent, in my mind, predicated on the fixed penalty regime being in place, which is a, a ticketing regime, which is not in place and will not be in place, as I understand it, for some time to come because it is not ready. The effect of that is that the police, if they're enforcing the, so the restrictions, the police arrest and take people or order people to go to the station. And this has happened, as we know, fairly recently. I know there was an example of a particular company that claimed that they were having a, an event which they understood to have been permitted. The police arrived, arrested, and <coughs> charged a number of their employees and support personnel that were supporting the event. It was some kind of corporate promotion, they claim. I happen to know one of the persons who got caught up in that. And what they told me was that when they got to the station, they were all bungled up into a room. It was a small police depot. And there was no social distancing in there. And it's, you know, so it's really counterintuitive and counterproductive that the enforcement of the protocols, of the rules, results in a more dangerous situation from a COVID spreading point of view than where they're coming from. So that is, I think, problematic. And I think the way in which the police approach the enforcement needs to bear that in mind. And the ticketing system is really critical because you don't want to be congregating people pursuant to arrest and charge for curfew violations or mask wearing violations. You want to have a carrot and a stick, yes, and you want people to comply. But the ticketing system, which was really the key element of that, is not yet in place. And the no warning regime means that this can be operated in a very oppressive way. And I'm quite concerned about that. The other point I wanted to ask you about, Prime Minister, 
relates to the Premier League football. The Premier League football clubs <coughs> employ quite a lot of people, not just players and coaches, but ancillary staff and so on. Vendors and <coughs> others live off of the football. And what we see in other countries, in the region, in Europe, in the United States, football is being played, albeit um, without fans being present. And we all understand that we can't have fans congregating in stadia to watch matches unless they were spaced out adequately and so on. Although, you know, in open air stadia, the risk of spread if persons were to be seated at six feet or so apart would probably not be that great. But we accept the idea that if you're going to allow football, they, you know, they, we can't have fans in the stadium. And the plan of the, the Premier League is to facilitate um, that by having the players in a bubble uh, during the, a shortened season and not having fans and basically relying on the televising of the matches as the main commercial um, source of commercial revenue for the league. I don't, we've been waiting a very long time now to hear what the government's plan is for this. And you know, with other competitions and so on, international competitions, the requirements of CONCACAF and FIFA, we can't just indefinitely keep postponing this thing. We need to kind of know. I think the players and everybody around football who depend on it need clarity um, as to where we're going. So you know, this is something we've been asking about for several weeks, months really. And you know, I, I really would like the government to make a decision and tell us what's going to happen. So, Prime Minister, you know, I support the idea, I have always supported the idea of encouraging personal responsibility. Mask wearing, I know not everybody believes in it, but it is, it has certainly, um, for most people, uh, most people are utterly convinced that it is an important part of protecting themselves and others from the spread of the virus, along with the other social distancing rules. The restrictions on movement are very harsh, in particular for those industries which require um, movement after dark, uh, you know, entertainment, bars, clubs, and so on. And many, many people who, not necessarily from uptown, but, you know, other communities are struggling as a result of the effect of these restrictions on them. And uh, you know, I would have been happy had I heard you say, well, the curfew hours would be relaxed you know, to uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, something like that. Yeah. And um, you know, with the gathering limits remaining intact for the time being. But it's not to be. So we will have to fit in with what, is, what has been proposed. And as I've said, the changes to the law that we have enacted here, which I was uncomfortable with, as you know, in, in certainly in respect of the, issue, the provisions for a criminal record, which were sorted out, but the ticketing system is not in effect. So the police do not have that tool in the toolbox for dealing with COVID-related violations, what, you know, of curfew or of mask wearing or whatever it may be. So what is available to the police if they decide to enforce the law is arrest and taking people to the station, processing them, etc. Sorry, madam. Uh, madam Speaker, the time being 7.20 p.m., I ask that the House be allowed to sit beyond 7.30 to complete the business of the day. The question is that it now being 7.20, the House be allowed to sit beyond 7.30 to complete the business of the day. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, so those are the issues for me. Um, as I understand it, the, the arrangements for tourists will remain. They won't have a quarantine system as such. They will be expected to remain within the, what has been called the resilient corridor. Is that, that's a, my understanding of what will remain for them. It's, so it's others who have to 
to quarantine, <clears throat> even if they are fully vaccinated, that will apply. Let us hope that the science quickly um, catches up with this and that we are able to confidently say that persons who are fully vaccinated have a much lower risk of transmission. Um, I know that there is some, um, there is some data that supports that view. That's my understanding, even though it has not been officially um, determined to be scientifically proved. But it is, um, it is hard for somebody who is visiting the country for a short space of time to have to quarantine for the full duration of their visit. But we understand, especially if they have been tested negative and they have been vaccinated. Uh, but it is what it is for now. So, Prime Minister, I think our spokesperson on health, the member from St. Mary Central, um, would like to say, say a few words. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, Prime Minister, we too are encouraged by the, the numbers, falling numbers in terms of both what have been found in terms of testing, the hospitalization rates, and the death rates as well. And you have indicated that the positive rate is coming down, or has been coming down, and certainly based on the figures sent out by the Ministry of Health over the past seven days, if you look at a weekly positive the rate is about 15%, coming from 16 and 20 the previous um, seven days. So we are looking at 21 days from um, 20 to 16.7 to 15.8. That's encouraging. And also, Prime Minister, the fact that they are zero is also falling. But they have a concern with that, Prime Minister, and it is one that is almost a recurrent decimal whenever you are the Minister of Health speaks, and I, ha and, and I get up and speak as well, because we know that for an accurate determination of the, the RO number, you need to do as extensive testing as possible. Because it basically, as you have outlined, not today, but in a previous presentation, the number of persons who would get infected from one person. Now, there's a fallacy that has been perpetuated, Prime Minister, which says that in a phase of community spread, that you do not know where you're getting it from, hence the whole aspect of doing testing and contact tracing does not <clears throat> need to be done as when you're not in community spread phase. You might not know where you're getting it from in a community spread phase, but the reality is that if you do contact tracing, if you're positive and contact tracing is done, then you will know who you have the potential to pass it to. Because if you are found to be positive, then you need to have a contact tracing for those persons who you may have come in contact with, and then you will be able to find out whether they, have, they are having the infection or have contracted the infection. Which is why we still on this side insist that our numbers of testing is far too low. The the f that is further compounded, Prime Minister, by what I may want to term a situation where the Ministry of Health has aided and abetted the reduction in the number of tests. They have ab aided and abetted the reduction in the cost of testing. Demand and supply dictates that prices will move based on the supply. Right now, Prime Minister, in the public sector, there are only three approved antigen testing by the Ministry of Health. Three. Two from one provider, one from another. And it's costing people out there, Madam Speaker, eight to $12,000 to do an antigen test. Now, we have been told from as far back as the 28th of last month, in another place, or the 23rd of, of March, in another place that the minister knows about, 
that the ministry is going to be looking at trying to open up the, the market for approved, specific, and sensitive testing. We are two months down the road and nothing has been done. In fact, I have seen correspondence dated the, 20, the 19th of April, which says that the ministry is not approving. Now, Prime Minister, we have been told at the World Health Organization we're looking from that list. But if the FDA, CDC, has approved a whole listing of antigen testing, the European Medical Agency has approved 25 antigen testing, right? And we are only wedded to three here, two from one supplier and one from another in this country, right? And there are good antigen testing out there. And I mean, Minister said he was going to look at it, but it looked like it's bigger than him right now. So I'm bringing it to your attention now. We need a situation where the market can be opened to these tests so that we do not solely rely on those three that are here, Prime Minister, because we run the risk of our Jamaican people in a situation where the government cannot find enough funds to deal with it, that we are also burdening those in the private sector to also get tests at these exorbitant price. There are good cheap tests out there, and let us explore that and have more people under a controlled situation, bringing them into this country so competition can take place. Prime Minister, the other, the other point I want to make as well is the, the matter of the, we mentioned hospitalizations first. And as I said before, we're happy that the numbers are coming down. But we have seen over the past weeks that there are, if you look at the category of deaths that are under investigation, hovering between 125 to 135 to 140, that so far we have not seen any determination as to what the cause of those deaths are. And quite frankly, one might be minded to add it to the number of deaths here in terms of the COVID numbers. And until... Right, I, I think we should. Right? But it's not added here. No, I know that, Prime Minister, but the reality is that that number has been existing. We, we appreciate that there's a rollover in terms of some that are added and some that are cleared up. But we need to have it done faster so we have a better appreciation that, ye yes, we have decreased numbers, we have decreased deaths coming down, but what of the total deaths in this country? You see, last year, Prime Minister, I mentioned something in the Parliament here that was mentioned, the Russian roulette. It was experience in Russia in the early phase when they were having the disease and they said their numbers were quite well, only to find that the death counts were increasing, right? RGD said that we weren't having that at that time last year, but we never had a, a, a first phase then, nor did we have the community spread phase, right? It would be interesting if we were to get the statistics now to see how many persons have died within a particular period of time, say from November last year until this current time, compared with other years, and even added COVID numbers, right? No, they have done that, right? I think it would be interesting for us to see, right, what, what the numbers are now. But Prime Minister, I, I also will close by, by still encouraging our people to continue to wear the mask. I've taken off mine just for speaking, but to wear the mask, <laughs> to ensure that we practice the, the social distancing, not following him so that we, we, we do the, the necessary sanitization that is necessary. And uh, Prime Minister, we know that our people generally are, are very, Ever you know what you know, is odd? Right. Now, we need for, for them to have a new mindset to understand that this thing, all of us are in it together, right? And we need to ensure that we protect our neighbor as well as protecting ourselves. And that is the hardest message that needs to get, get out there. And I think all of us here, the, the, the 63 of us in this house, need to go out there on a drive as well to encourage, even from our constituents, our people, to, to adhere to the rules and to, to practice the, the, the measures. Hmm?
McElroy. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Mr. Prime Minister, I have three very quick questions um, for you. So the first one is about the website um, for the transportation for school. Yes. Um, I know that a lot of persons can access the website. I'm always mindful that we have more than one Jamaica. We don't like it, but we do. And therefore, I'm hoping that there is also other means of um, getting the information, like a phone line or something. So I wanted to ask you that. The second one is around PEP. To you, Mr. Prime Minister, and to the Madam Minister, my interaction with stakeholders is that they are tired, um, for want of a better word, of the kind of short notice. We know, we know that the environment in which we are working, that the decisions are difficult decisions to make, the choices are not easy, and that we are weighing a number of things. But they tell me that, for example, even just a notice in terms of when the PEP exam was going to um, be done, and uh, the change is now that um, they are allowed to help prepare persons for PEP and to then take PEP, even with the modification that has been done, that it has been short, and they actually almost see it as being disruptive because it's so difficult to maintain any kind of planning. So I want when these decisions are being made for us to see if we can give a little bit more notice time, yes, and um, prepare them a little bit more for those decisions. Uh, so that's two. The third has to do with the submission of the SBAs. I'm pleased to hear that we did some additional advocacy and that there is some change in terms of the timeline for the submission of SBAs. But to be honest, um, Prime Minister, when I speak to stakeholders, their greatest disappointment is that they do not believe that those who should have been advocating on their behalf did it strenuously enough, early enough, and consistently enough before now. Because it has been quite some time that they have been saying that too many of their students would not have been ready for the SBAs for this year. And, uh, you know, I, I want to suggest that, uh, and, and it is a recurring theme as well from our teachers and our educators, that they are not being listened to, that they are not being, being pulled in sufficiently. And I know that I have raised this matter before, and that the minister has told me that there is constant collaboration. I hear that. All I'm going to say is, and I go back to collaboration, you know, is a ladder, right? And there's the top at the ladder and there's the bottom. At the bottom is somebody come and tell you something and say it's gonna be done this time, and people might say something or not. And at the top of the ladder is where we actually sit down and we make sure that enough of the stakeholders are part of the conversation and they feel as if they have a stake in it and as if they really are contributing to the decision-making process. Now, the truth is that Jamaican governments overall don't really take this consultation seriously. We we'll come and tell people something and we think that that is it. I'm asking for us to really, really make the effort to ensure that far more individuals are pulled in and are part of the discussion so that they feel as if they are part of the process. Right now they don't, and that is not a good place to be. Uh, yeah. yeah, and those are the three issues I wanted to raise. Thank you very much. I want to thank the members for the questions that they have asked and for the support that they have given to the national effort. Uh, ma Madam Speaker, I may sound a bit muffled, but I will keep my mask on because it's a short response. Um, 
uh, leader of the opposition, the police is not now required to warn, but they still warn as deemed appropriate. So they do use their discretion, and they have been very tolerant. And that has been the instruction that the, the measure is not meant to be oppressive, and, and they have been given that policy direction. When we were contemplating the use of uh, measures that would restrict movement, we did incorporate the unique Jamaican situation where we have a substantial part of our population that would not have the convenience to stay at home. And within our culture, with, with just how we have evolved as a people, you know, our home is the community. Uh, so not, not all houses in Jamaica have clearly defined fences, have clearly defined yards with gates, and so people live. You know, they're on the street till all hours of night, and uh, you know, we, we have come across situation, situations in which the police have told people to go inside, and the response is, well, I am waiting on my turn to sleep. And that is the reality. And so the police is sensitive to that. We have discussed that at the level of the commissioner. And I am expecting that that would cascade down to the various commanders, that we have to use these measures with understanding and sensitivity. So the, the real prosecution that you're going to find taking place would be for persons who are breaching the curfew well away from their homes. They are in public spaces, they are going to you know, parties, and they are traveling when they shouldn't be traveling, these kinds of things. And the police understand that the objective isn't to pick up everybody and take them to the station. That would be contributing to the spread. But, but we have to prosecute. We have to prosecute, uh, and we have to do it fairly and equitably so that every strata of the society understands that the law applies to them equally. So whilst I'm getting the complaints, you know, I know that we are doing something right when we are getting complaints from you know, the inner city areas and we are getting complaints from you know, middle class and, and so forth. And that, that's, the law has to be applied equally. And we're not going to always get it right, but I give every citizen the commitment that we are monitoring and as soon as we see an issue, we try to recalibrate to get it as perfect as possible. But yeah, sometimes errors are made, but it, it is not that the system is bad. The ticket, we, Minister McKenzie is in charge of mobilizing the government effort to get it ready. We got a report last week we got a report last week, and there are some, I must admit that there are some challenges, but, but in terms of the technical issues, uh, I would say in another three to four weeks, we should be close to solving the technical issues. For example, the issuing of uh, an, electronic, an electronically generated ticket, something that we should be close to doing. But nevertheless, the police do have powers, and they are prosecuting. So. So that, and, and I think every member of the society should be aware of that, that the police are enforcing. Um, in terms of the Premier League uh, leader of the opposition, uh, Minister Mackenzie will be meeting with the Premier League Association tomorrow, and I suspect they may, they may have some good news. Uh, Minister Grange and Minister Tufton have worked out an arrangement now where our athletes who, who as it stands now, are on their way to Japan, to Tokyo. What I mean is that they are training. <laughs> but as it, as it stands now, the Olympics is still slated to be held, and they are still training and qualifying and so forth. And we expect them to, to participate. We have now arranged for them to be vaccinated. Over 100 have been scheduled now. Over 200, sorry. 300, the number moves, almost 300, I didn't realize we have so many, so many. 300 athletes will, will be vaccinated and we're going to extend this to include the other sports persons, the footballers and the you know, swimmers and so forth. So, so that we, we will ensure that Jamaica will still have a strong representation for sports, uh, as particularly the Olympics. 
uh, I will be meeting with the new entertainment advisory board, as I had indicated the last time I spoke, to start the discussion about a stronger recovery for music and entertainment. Uh, and um, we, you know, we genuinely want to help the entertainment sector. We see it as an important industry in Jamaica's recovery. And, and we are, you know, like you, we are very concerned that there are industries that have been hard hit than others, and this being, being one of them. Um, uh, member from Southwest St. Andrew, the issue of, you know, the, we tend to take for granted and believe that internet access is universal and people are, um, you know, digitally literate, and that's not the case. Not everybody will have access to the website. The minister has advised that the regional offices or the schools uh, would be points of contact if, if parents need help with transportation, masks, sanitization, and so forth. They, they could attend on the school and, and they would be um, supported. The other issues raised regarding um, PEP and, and the time and, and so forth, the minister, I'm certain, will address these when, when she speaks another time in parliament. Some time ago, from February, I recall that. Uh, in terms of the issues raised by the member from um, St. Mary's Central, uh, we, we have done a study on debts, and I would ask the minister to make it available to you or to present it to, to parliament. Uh, in terms of testing, we, we are always having that debate. I'm always agreeing with you that we need to test more, but I'm also saying that our test strategy is appropriate and sufficient. Um, we, we, we still do contact tracing as, 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 as much as, as possible, um, but you're right. I mean, within, within community spread, the logical thing to assume is that everyone who you come upon uh, uh, has either been infected or, 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 or um, is in the process of, of being infected. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, uh, with those responses, and the time is well spent, um, I thank the members once again. Madam Speaker, it's not intended to do any further work for the day. And so I ask for the adjournment um, until tomorrow the 5th of May at 2 p.m. And Madam Speaker, I'd just like to indicate that the items that were on the agenda for today that we were not able to take will be taken tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, members, the question is that the House be adjourned until tomorrow, the 5th of May. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. This house is now adjourned. <laughs>